Progressive Snapshot can save you money based on how you drive and how much you drive. So the safer you drive, the more money you could save. Now, if you didn't hear that because you were looking at your phone while driving, let me say it again. Seriously, put down your phone. That is so unsafe. If you didn't do stuff like use your phone while driving, you could save money with Progressive Snapshot. But saving or not, just put it down. <clears throat> and if you did hear it the first time because you weren't looking at your phone, nice work. You'd love Snapshot from Progressive because it rewards safe drivers. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Snapshot not available in California and North Carolina or from all agents. So, and, and of course, this is another instance where, like, the music kicks in halfway through the scene and it's like it's trying to compensate for missing the first half by being overly dramatic for the second <laughs> half. It definitely does. It's all sudden and unexpected that I, I spat my tea out pretty much. <laughs> yeah, it's like this is the first time that I'd written. It's like the music director turned up late to the edit and then felt too guilty to ask them to go back right. so you can put the music in at that point. Exactly. So I'll, I'll just pick up from here, guys. It's fine. It's fine. It's my fault. <laughs> God awful movie 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because that fortune cookie was very convincing. I'm your host, No Illusions. Heath will be unable to join us today, but sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? I am fantastic, Noah. Or am I? Tell me the truth, you lily livered rat thing. <laughs> you can't handle the truth, damn it. <laughs> Got me again. And also joining us today is the host of Be Reasonable, co host of Skeptics with a K, project director for the Good Thinking Society, and editor of the Skeptic Magazine, Michael Marshall. Marsh, welcome back, sir. Hey, thanks for having me back, guys. Always an absolute pleasure. And this, this one was. It, it was it was a film. It was just about a film. I can I can accept this as a film. <laughs> All right, well, there you go. <laughs> the pictures moved. Michael <laughs> Marshall coming to the Grace of God poster near you. <laughs> <laughs> we have beaten him down already. Okay, so tell us, Marsh, what will we be breaking down today? So we watched Grace of God. And it's the story of a church that has thirty thousand dollars of its money stolen, and then it's there deeply disinterested attempts at getting that back. <laughs> yes. and this film, it might as well be atheist propaganda about how religious organizations have way too much money. Yes, yeah. a, a huge amount of this movie is dedicated to, so you guys want to figure out what happened to it, or uh, what are you thinking? Oh, no, let's <laughs> not bother anybody with the money. <laughs> and Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if you love crime novels, but you've never read one longer than the Ten Commandments. Plus, you're pretty sure atheism is just the audio of Noah trying to fix a computer. <laughs> you will love this movie. <laughs> Man, I will be honest with you. After last week, I didn't think you could fuck up a whodunit worse. <laughs> Right. But yep. I should have known better. There's always a worse. It can always be done worse and we will always find it. <laughs> yeah. It's like Dante's Inferno. You can keep plumbing new depths. You'll find yeah. new new levels all the way down. <laughs> right. yep. Oh, God, Jesus. Which which ring of hell are we in now? <laughs> <laughs> so is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I want to say best worst music cues. And this was something that I will return to throughout my notes. It starts with something I, I noticed as, oh, that'll be a, a little funny bit that I can do as we go. And towards the end, every time the music cue came in, it caught me by surprise and made me laugh because the, whoever's the music director on this, I don't think they were present for much of the film. My theory is essentially they just had an alarm clock that never really went off on time and they were persistently <laughs> late to the shoot <laughs> because constantly the music cue comes in at the last second of the shoot that like they've been talking for a while yeah a dramatic thing has happened it's silence in the background and then suddenly -da, da -da, like yeah. out of nowhere yeah <laughs> not always synced up to the action no nope. no 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 absolutely not <laughs> no so if we found out later that the entire audio was just the the, the soundtrack was kicked off by 18 seconds or something <laughs> And nobody knew, so and everybody's sense. like, wow, that's an interesting choice that our music director made or something like that. I would not be all that surprised by it. <laughs> well, that's the wonderful thing about this movie is it is 
it is that beautiful kind of poor execution that only we have the privilege of perusing where like everyone involved was doing such a bad job that why should the music not be off by 25 <laughs> seconds <laughs> right <laughs> it's not like anyone was going to turn to him and at any point and be like hey man we're trying to make a good movie here <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so I was going to go with some I, I, mighty big shoes to fill. Best worst shoehorned co-star. Now, look, <laughs> we have watched movies, several, where like the co-star of the movie, the, the name that you've heard of in the movie, it just like shows up on a ransom tape at some point in the middle <laughs> of the film. I still think this movie does it worse. It's Cliff Clavin. John Rassenberger shows up in this movie and he just, he might as well just pop up at the beginning and say, see, I'm in this and then walk <laughs> away. Can John Rassenberger not do a character that isn't Cliff Clavin? Because I mean, we'll get to it, but he very clearly does Cliff Clavin <laughs> as his character. Yeah. E even when he's a plastic pig, he's yeah. still Cliff Clavin. <laughs> he's still yeah. is doing Cliff Clavin. <laughs> yes. And he gets like top billing in the credits. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. How? <laughs> He's in it for, I'm, it's almost like I feel like I'm in this film more often than he is. I, feel like I spend more time in this film than he does. Definitely. Definitely. We paused this film. He never even watched it. <laughs> and I'm going to go with best worst unnecessarily 80 yard moment. What was that? It's right. It's amazing unto itself. But the best part is watching it affect Marsh's psyche for the rest of his notes. So I watched this film before you guys. And so all, all of the kind of leading through of what scenes which I was one sort of scribbling those in. And I don't, I wasn't convinced that this wasn't just something that had happened to me. And then I, I expected <laughs> your notes to be just like, don't know what Marsh is on about. This, this is absolutely <laughs> normal. And that you're just going to gaslight me in this. But you guys heard that too. I'm not going crazy. That was a real thing that happened. No, this is, this is Marsh's. Why did they charge us for the snacks? Yeah. And it will haunt him <laughs> through the entire <laughs> second half of the film as well. It should. We'll yeah, exactly. Done. Exactly. <laughs> In Marsh's defense, it was batshit. So weird. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. We've got a lot of boring to try to make interesting out of. So we're going to pause for a warm up. But we'll be back in a flash with all the melodrama that is grace of God. How about gymnastics? You seem live. Eli, for the last time, no. Hey, guys. What's up? Oh, hey, Noah. I'm just suggesting new hobbies for Marsh in the hopes that he'll stop making new variants of COVID so that he can be skeptic of the year over and over again. Nice. Have you tried Indian cooking? Ooh, how about that, buddy? Huh? You could learn to make ghee. You want to make some ghee? Guys, I've told you already. We've given that award to other people already. Like mm, twice now. I don't remember that. I don't think you have. Yeah. And anyway, if I wanted to pick up the new skills that you're talking about, I'd just sign up for Masterclass. What's Masterclass? With Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best minds anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. You can learn how to cook from Gordon Ramsay, improve your chess skills with Gary Kasparov, or learn philosophy from Cornel West. With over 100 classes from a range of world-class instructors, that thing you've always wanted to do is closer than you think. He's right. I actually signed up for Masterclass even before they were a sponsor, and Steve Martin's class on comedy is great. Hell, even Penn & Teller did a great class on magic, and with the ability to watch on your laptop, phone, or smart TV, you can learn almost anywhere. Yeah, exactly. I can highly recommend that you check it out. Get unlimited access to every masterclass. And as a god awful movies listener, you'll get 15% off an annual membership. Go to masterclass.com slash awful now. That's masterclass.com slash awful for 15% off masterclass. All right, Marsh, thanks. That sounds amazing. Hey, you ever think about teaching a class on there? On skepticism? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I don't no, think. No, I think on COVID making, probably. Yeah. Right, right. I guess you probably want to keep that to yourself, huh? Sure. So you can stay skeptic of the year. <laughs> That's never going to die. <laughs> All right, guys, you ready to write our big Christian movie? I sure am. Praise the Lord. So a couple of things before we start. Carol is going to star in it because she's letting us use her house, but she'd also like to be the one who done it. Uh, That's... That's not really much of a mystery then, right? No, no, I'm sure it's fine. Also, also, Greg is going to play the pastor. He's written it himself. Uh, he's Well, he's written several yell, crying monologues about Jesus that he wants to just kind of slot in wherever he sees fit 
as we go? Oh, um, okay, okay. And finally, Christopher would like to do the music, but he refuses to watch the movie. So we're just going to insert his music randomly or, or something like that as he said, hey, you know, whatever. And let's not forget, no matter what we make this movie about, the real crime is not being Christian. So let's really hit that message home. OK, yeah. OK. Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess if that's what you want. Are you guys ready for me to yell the intro and outro yet? Clock is ticking. Uh, come in, Mr. Ratzenberger. You have four minutes. And we're back for the breakdown, and we're going to open this up on some straight-up fucking hubris. The first words that we see on the screen after the production companies and shit are series written by <laughs> on a movie that he is, as near as I can tell, not part of a series yet. So. Yet, Noah, <laughs> yet. It's at the center of my vision board for the new year. Yeah, right, right. And I've got to say, I, was, I wasn't watching this on Amazon Prime like you guys were, because it's not available in UK Amazon Prime. Eli had to find me on christiancinema.com and I thought logging into Pure Flix would be the low point <laughs> of my no. career with you guys on this show. But no, I've given christiancinema.com my credit card details. That's how much faith I have Ooh, in this show. It's already been hacked. It's already <laughs> lost. It's yeah. all, your password on Christian Cinema should be 1234 because they're going to tweet it tomorrow by accident. <laughs> <laughs> Christian Cinema, by the way, for those who are wondering, whenever you're like, wow, where did they find this obscure, terrible movie? It is our bottom of the barrel. If, if we're ready for some low quality material, that's when I turn to Christian cinema. Yeah, yeah. right, right. Exactly. Well, we want sub pure flicks. Yeah. <laughs> They'll carry the homophobia that the pussies over in pure flicks are afraid to do. <laughs> but look, it's, it's all right. If Christian cinema do hack my bank account and steal my money, they'll just give me it back and then I'll get that money from somewhere else somehow. So it's all, it all. Oh, well, there sense. you go. Yeah. Actually, as it, <laughs> as it turns out, which we're about to learn. But first, we have to have their sweet pyramid building credits thing. Like, there was clearly more money spent on these credits than on everything else they did in the movie. <laughs> sure was. Also, Moses, the slavery, none of that will ever come back. Nope. No, not at all. Not at all. Also, I was trying to do, I like to do a little bit of background research on the film, see if there's anyone interesting and things like that. I tried to look the film up on IMDb, and it's not called Grace of God on IMDb. It's no. called The Ten Take which I think is presumably named after its shooting schedule because <laughs> the level of acting in this. Oh, you know what? I bet this though. I bet the whole series concept was they were going to do one movie for each of the Ten Commandments. This oh, is the Thou Shalt Not Steal. Right. And this, I, that's, that's my guess. I'm, I, we're going to go with that. I think you're probably right. And they probably didn't do the series because they realized that the first four commandments are basically the same thing. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. And they're like, I don't know if we can do a whole one on that again. Well, so, certainly not four of them. <laughs> Guys, are we supposed to do a movie about not wanting things? <laughs> I think it's okay to want stuff. Yeah. How would we even show wanting as a, yeah, it's fine. We'll just do this one. We'll just yeah, do just one, one of these modern films about carving idols. Yeah. <laughs> We've got an hour and a half drama out of it. All right. So, but yeah, so we get their sweet ass Exodus credits and then eventually we, we resolve to pastor John Ratzenberger. Now, this is how lazily they shoehorn this guy. Cause obviously like, they got the deal with Ratzenberger after they'd filmed the whole fucking movie. They were like, oh, wow, we can get you for eight minutes. <laughs> fucking sweet. Sorry, we were we were going to buy your cameo as a gift for my brother. But then we saw that there was a third option, which was be in my movie. for right. six dollars more. <laughs> yeah. So but like, OK, so he's going to be he's going to be the grandpa in Princess Bride of this, except He's only going to show up at the beginning to say, like, I'm a pastor and I'm doing a sermon. And he, let me tell you a story. It's the story of this movie. <laughs> yeah. And even that, he can't get out as coherently as you just did. No. He starts just rambling about different types of stationery. He's like, oh, something was stolen from a church. And I don't mean stationery like paper clips and... um um, sta staplers, and, and I'm pretty sure he was just asked <laughs> to add, well, either he was asked to ad lib items of stationery or he just chose to ad lib items of stationery. <laughs> but I guarantee this was not in the script. There is a continuing theme throughout this movie that it's okay to steal stationery from your church. <laughs> yes. I don't know. I don't know what <laughs> message this movie was hoping to send, but. Pretty much every character takes a moment to be like, steal some paper shit from your church. Well, you know they don't pay taxes, right? You usually take, take whatever you want. But I think I've had an epiphany. I think 
stationary wasn't in the script. I think it was a stage direction. It was telling him not to move around. And he's so bad <laughs> that he just read stationary. He was like, well, you haven't told me what you mean by stationary. I'm going to have to elaborate. <laughs> so... Yeah, yeah, exactly. So then we doodly do into the story that he's telling for the remainder of the film. Hmm. So we're going to start off by meeting Stan, the sweaty accountant, and Pastor Stevens. And Stan is explaining to Pastor Stevens that the $30,000 that was in the safe has gone missing. Yes. And the reason he was keeping $30,000 in the safe <laughs> is that if they put less than $30,000 in the bank, they would have to pay a banking fee. What the? But like, how was this church handling $30,000 in cash without having a bank account? This sounds like laundering. This is money laundering. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, apparently they were holding on to 30 grand in cash. Yeah. It was just resting in their safe. Yeah. Right. And so, of course, the first thing I write in my notes is like, has anybody checked the bathroom walls? Because I hear sometimes they like to put them. We've all got that at some point for sure. <laughs> oh, right on, right on. The camera flashes over to the janitor played by Joel Osteen just whistling loudly. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So then, so these two go to Constance's office to tell her about it. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, why wouldn't they just put Constance in the first scene so that we could just like make this an extension? Like, get used to that question. There will be so many times when you're like, well, these are the same two characters. Why did we switch fucking scenes? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you told me that this movie doubled as an educational films for how human beings enter and exit buildings for aliens, I'd be like, <laughs> oh, okay. Cool. Two birds. Oh, they pull into a driveway. I sure hope we can see that again and get the details. <laughs> so, and by the way, I have Constance down as poor man's Gwyneth Paltrow. So like Gwyneth acquaintance tro. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. So, but Pastor Stevens, he says, Hey, Constance, are you sure that you didn't take 30 grand in cash out of the safe, set up a bank account on your own without talking to anybody and deposit it? And she's like, Yeah, pr I'm almost positive I didn't do that. <laughs> yes. If I stole the money, would I have this very neat ledger? <laughs> right yeah exactly she's like no if i stole the money she busted out like fucking kavanaugh's calendar or something right like if i had stolen the money it would be right here i would have it in this ledger and she gets way too little into it before they're like all right all right enough already she's like yes you can see i keep on there like yeah you didn't do it good no no anyone who owns a moleskin notebook couldn't steal thirty thousand dollars <laughs> but the thing is the conversation these characters are having, I was absolutely sure was like they knew full well that this was money laundering because they said like at one point she says, you know, it's just that we've lost funds before and they've turned up. And you can actively hear her say the inverted rabbit ear, bunny ear things around lost yes. because this has happened before. They've definitely done this before. It just seems yeah. like this whole scene is there to justify how churches handle money with zero accountability. Yeah. Right. Well, she even, he's like, now, okay, so who even has access to this safe? And she immediately has right there a folder with <laughs> a, the very top thing is a list of all the people who have access to the safe. And I wrote in my notes, well, if this wasn't terribly written, that would be proof that she did it. <laughs> right no hey you know what spoiler alert she did it right we're not she gonna bother it. like the movie won't reveal that until the third act but like just so you know so that the rest of this movie's <laughs> ridiculousness can really sink in i'll tell you now she's who done it yeah and this movie will reveal it to us like a sloppy side relationship you're trying to reveal to a significant other too late it's just like oh no it's always been you I dated someone at the same time for like a month at the very beginning but it's always been you darling she stole the money it totally does oh and by the way the plot of the movie so even even this list that she has of all of the people who had access to the safe, apparently they've issued keys and codes to everyone on this list. And it's two A4 pages worth of people. Yeah. Which, for one, is more than we've seen in any of the congregations that we'll see in this film. So where they're finding those people, I'm not sure. But it's like, 
where did the $30,000 go? Oh, well, we spent it all cutting keys for the safe, apparently. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, that's what I, because they're, they're like, well, you know, people always need access to the money and then I, they, I, we don't want them to have to come and get us every time. I'm like, who needs, why do you need to pay for so much shit in cash? Is this a heroin shirt? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You're expecting Melissa to just hold on to the music club money for days at a time? Yeah. What is she, Serpico? No, come on. <laughs> we had no choice but to give her a key in the code to our only finances. <laughs> well, and then just as I'm thinking to myself, are you a heroin church? They go like, should we call the police? And everybody's like, oh, I don't know about all that. You know, like, why would you not know about all that? <laughs> yeah. The third purpose of this movie might be a timeshare pitch for robbing your local church. <laughs> no, seriously, they, they won't even call the cops. They'll just uh, yeah. sit there looking sad at each other. <laughs> so I think this also gives away why they won't call the cops. Because at one point she says, well, you know, a criminal investigation, that could take a long time and it could really hurt us. And they can't possibly mean they could hurt us in the sense of we've cut too many keys. They've got bodies to hide. They've got <laughs> crimes they've covered up. Like the church is reluctant to call the police. That tracks with what we know about the church. <laughs> well, right, right. So to be clear, the reason that you would be hesitant to call the cops over your missing $30,000 is because something more criminal than that is going on. Yeah. More criminal that you don't feel capable of hiding from the police. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, right. No, they, they they have. And even like the writer can't come up with a single good reason for them not to call the cops. But they're all sitting there going like, well, you know, if we call the cops, they're pro it'll smell like coffee in here pre like pretty much right <laughs> away or something. And they're all like nodding along. Going, That's a pretty good reason. Like I thought that they all three of them had stolen it and are just like doing this in case there was a bug for some. Or, I don't know. <laughs> oh, God, that would have been such an incredible twist if it turns out every character we saw in this other than the private detective were all involved in murder on the orient express the robbery Absolutely. movie spoiler alert uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so but then eventually one of them comes up with the idea they're like hey you know what we could call an ace private eye that i know yeah, yeah. maybe maybe they can take pictures of someone fucking our money <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like, you know, let's hire a private detective with all that money we no longer have because right. it's been stolen. Yeah, we're going to get the same thing done for free by the police. But hey, you know, we wouldn't be. And they even say like, well, you know, if we hire a private investigator, we can pull the plug right before he finds the bodies. When he's like, hey, can I dig in this part of the floor? We could be like, no, you can't. No. So. And honestly, this plot, this subplot in our head that they like have, that they're like an Irish orphanage with a fucking well full of dead <laughs> babies <laughs> makes so much more of the rest of this movie make sense. Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. No kidding. He'll spend the rest of the movie being like, can I open this door? And they'll be like, it is not filled with baby skeletons. <laughs> so no. <laughs> Normal, full grown adult skeletons. Nope, not those either. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're, they're babies, but not skeletons. No, that's still not very good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> skeletons, but not oh, human shit. ones. That's legal. Okay. That's not legal. <laughs> so, so yeah, so they decide they're going to call a private dick, but tomorrow, you know, they'll get around to it eventually. So then we follow Constance home and we get to meet her daughter. Now, she's got two daughters. We're first going to meet Brenda, the bitchy daughter. Yes, and she looks like an evangelical conservative version of Kate Mara. She's Kate Marga. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well done, sir. Hey, why the fuck is this character in the movie? I don't know. <laughs> it's so, she's so unnecessarily confusing. There's So, like, she shows up and she's like, God, Mom, you're finally at home. I want to take your car and go to the gym. And she's like, oh, okay, dude, would you, you sure you don't want to stay home and do some chores? She's like, oh, every time, this is the actual line she responds with. Every time I say something you, you don't like, you throw it in my face. Like what? It doesn't, what the hell is going on? That's not remotely the interaction that happened. Here is my theory about why this character exists. I think the woman who played Constance at some point walked into the writer's meeting and she was like, oh, I'm sorry, my daughter has just been unbearable. And they were like, what, do you want to take it out on her in the movie? Do you want to just reenact <laughs> every argument as you remember it with your daughter? 
Right. So I had my notes yesterday during this exchange. I'm like, this whole conversation is like when you think that somebody on the phone is talking to you and they won't, they don't just tell you, they don't just point to their phone right away. <laughs> That's the conversation they're having. Yeah, yeah. Like her daughter's got her earbuds in, but you can't see them under her head. Right. Yeah, happening. exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But yeah, mom tells her, she's like, you know, it's been, it's been a really rough day. Somebody stole from the church and she goes, who would steal from the church? You know, that would give you bad, <laughs> she goes, that would give you bad karma. The mom's like, karma is of the devil, honey. But yes, I see what you mean. <laughs> yeah, she says Christians don't believe in karma. It's like, yeah, Christians don't believe in karma, silly. Instead, we believe that wrongdoing is punishable by spending eternity in a lake of fire being prodded in naughty bits by a red man with horns. <laughs> karma is silly if you think about it. So, and then we cut to mom and a different daughter. So bold. Who is also <laughs> red haired chatting about the fucking uh, this daughter's abusive husband apparently her hu husband hit her and she's going to stay with mom for a few days this movie is very agnostic about abusive husbands <laughs> it's like there was an abusive husband in the writer's room and they had decided this would be a plot thing and then he was like i mean everyone hits their wife occasionally right and they were like yeah <laughs> so, yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the problem is that he's stealing from her. And it's like, well, I mean, it's, it's not that like sometimes you steal from your wife that you hit. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I, we'll, <laughs> we'll put in both sides of that argument <laughs> into our movie. <laughs> and of course, Julie at this point points out that like he stole a bunch of money from her. And boy, she sure could use $30,000 to pay her mortgage. Hey, that's a good plot point. I guess it won't spoil the entire movie if the mom has already stolen the money for information she finds out in this the next scene. scene yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I never even realized that because this, <laughs> this scene washed over me at the time. But that's incredible. It's so <laughs> stupid. I want mom to call her coke dealer and be like, "Hey, I know we had plans. I know. <laughs> I know." <laughs> Call Jeff and Jelaine and tell them we don't need that either. Yeah, I know. I'm I'm also disappointed. I got to do this daughter thing with it instead. Oh, and by the way, speaking of tying the entire Piat verse together, I should point out that Julie is the wife from Fireproof. Ooh. Yeah. Right. Now we know why he's hitting her. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's been four months without any porn. Get this. <laughs> no. Give me your chicken accounts. <laughs> Go into the batting cages. No, and I wrote, keeping in mind that I didn't yet know they were going to make this reveal, I wrote Julie's line as, what's wrong, mom? You have this I stole 30 grand look about you. But, <laughs> but okay, but we also learn here, she's, you know, Julie's like, maybe we should pray about it. And mom's like, nah, you know what? I have to, I will, so bye. <laughs> and leaves. Yep, she's doing the whole crisis of faith thing. And, and I didn't realize, I hadn't clicked on that she'd uh, stolen the money at this point. And I wrote, well, yeah, why would a five-figure theft from her church on top of her daughter being in a serially abusive relationship make her doubt the existence of a loving God? It just makes no well, sense. Who can I even imagine? Doesn't add up. How the <laughs> so she might as well try to pray and like miss the other hand as she tries to put them together. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, uh -huh. I've sprained my wrist. I can't. <laughs> So, yeah, okay. So now it's the next day. We're going to watch Constance arrive at work. This is the second of what I believe is six times that we watch Constance pull up at either her work or her home. Yes, yep. but this is the only time she forgets to put the parking brake on. Yeah, the that's true. It's the best. <laughs> they kept it in the... They keep Constance almost backing over the cameraman in this movie for legal reasons. Ten takes. They could only afford ten takes. That's fair. Must be it. <laughs> So, yeah, so, but this is where we're, we're going to meet the private investigator that they've hired, whose name is Bill Broadley. <laughs> and Bill Broadley is my favorite character. <laughs> I want him in every Christian movie. Bill Broadley is obviously written by someone who has heard about private investigators, mm -hmm. but is pretty sure they're just like freelance cops. <laughs> So this character yes. might as well be walking around with a goddamn magnifying glass the entire time, right? Yeah. He is so, and, and of course, also, he's written as an atheist by like somebody who half remembers that argument he lost to his niece on Facebook, mm -hmm. right? So he's just throwing in some of the insults that he remembers her saying, but not the justifications for them. 
yeah, and he's doing that, but he's also doing it to win that argument with his niece because it's like, well, I'm going to say all the things that she said, but at the end, he converts. So it turns out I was right all along in yeah, my exactly, thing that exactly. I'm writing. Yeah, this is very much a shower argument of a movie. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, I wish this portrayal of atheism was true. Just every time you have to do an activity at a church, you know, you guys are all a bunch of fucking hypocrites. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, thank you for the free cookies. I don't know why I said that. Yeah, right. No. So she's she's like, wow, you got here even earlier than me. He's like, yeah, I was checking the perimeter <laughs> of the building. He adds in of the building as though like he was like, I, I wasn't checking out your perimeter. I was I, I the buildings <laughs> of the city. I wasn't doing the whole town. Yeah. anymore they told me to stop <laughs> also this is one of the first really lovely music moments where just as she meets him oh yes the music cue i'm pretty sure the music cue is saying she's about to be attacked by jaws it's like yep. dum, and then bill Bradley pops up <laughs> the music in this movie constantly seems to think something way more true like the music should stop at a certain point and go oh my my bad guys i just assumed there was so not, never sorry <laughs> are you guys making a movie in here because i <laughs> We're using the studio. I think I brought all these dramatic strings. I don't know what to do with. <laughs> this is also where we get the first of Bill Broadley's wisdom, uh, what I call a Broadleyism. Mm. You can't judge a book by its cover, but sometimes it can lead you in the right direction. Which, which made me really picture this guy just staring super hard at a book's cover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like. I love this. Like sometimes the book cover can lead you in the right direction. It's like, yes, because a book cover isn't there to throw you off the set. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bright pink cover. Oh, it's a murder mystery. Okay. <laughs> and like, if I judge this movie by its cover, I'd expect to see a lot more of John Ratzenberger for one. <laughs> <laughs> and Lorenzo Lamas when it comes right down to yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, it's fair. Yeah. So, but this is also where she starts in the, with the like, She's just like out of the blue. She's like, you know, believe in Jesus or think very much of church, do you? And I'm like, why the fuck would she bring that up? But Bill, incapable of dishonesty, is like, yeah, you guys are a bunch of fucking hypocrites and you suck. You fucking suck. <laughs> I love what he says here. He says, people are people, whether they have religion or not. What I don't like, like is this idea that some think they're better than others because they believe in something. Some, sooner or later, they'll all be exposed as hypocrites. And I wrote, did a diatribe write this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote late, later in my notes, I'm like, Bill, this is a weird thing for the diatribe guy from the scathing atheist to tell you, but calm the fuck down. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's so amazing to see what Christians think we don't like about them. It's, just, it's that I'm too handsome. You Christians, the problem is you're all too handsome and too smart. And your book makes too much sense. I hate it. That's <laughs> it's so hard on me. And there's a really lovely moment in this scene as well, because she's already asked him, like, have you found anything out? And he said, oh, it's too early to tell. It's like, yeah, because you've just walked around the outside of the building. You haven't even met anyone yet. It's way too early to tell. I can't tell from the perimeter of the building. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then he says, oh, so is the, is the money kept with the pastor? And she says, no, we decide to keep it not in the pastor's room, in a different room for more accountability. It's like, right. But you thought there was more accountability in keeping the money in a room that nobody guards? That's more accountability in a room that nobody's always in. Right. That anybody could just go in. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, if you wanted more accountability, the, why not a bank account? <laughs> so. We wanted to keep everything free and clear. So we got that pig from Squid Games and we just hang all the money from the <laughs> ceiling that way. <laughs> So yeah, so she, but she takes him to the money safe room, and along the way they pass janitor Lorenzo Lamas. Uh, this is Gerald. Yes, the character's name. And she immediately says, "Bill Broadley, Private Eye. This is Gerald, our church caretaker." And I thought, do all private eyes like to be introduced with their job title right away? Because I've got a feeling <laughs> some of them like to sort of slow play that to try and learn stuff. <laughs> and there's this amazing, like, weird sexist moment that happens immediately upon these two guys meeting. This is the you're gonna rape her, no you're gonna rape her. Yes, fight. right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bill's like, hey, so you're a you, you're a man, and you knew that there was a woman alone in a big building. Are you okay with that? And he's like, why would the size of the building matter? Um, I don't. There's so much that doesn't make sense. <laughs> I mean, if anything, a big building is better than a small building if you're alone with somebody unsafe. Right, yeah, you'd have more places to run and hide. Yeah. <laughs> also, the caretaker here looks like if you put small-time crook into that AI picture engine, this is yeah. what it, is. Yes. it would spit out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so she's like, well, I better take him to the safe room. And he's like, you know what? I'll take him to the safe room because maybe he was going to rape you. 
<laughs> then if that's his thing. They might as well do like a top of the bat race for who gets to not rape her on the way to the same race. <laughs> yes. There's also what's amazing about these two characters is that they're supposed to not like each other, but you know, eventually they see eye to eye because they both are good men with good hearts. Except the space aliens who wrote this movie have no idea why people would not like each other or like each other or what human speech sounds like. Hmm. So they'll just start frowning at each other randomly at this point and continue till the end of the movie. Well, no, and then, and then randomly halfway through the movie, they'll suddenly not be like that anymore. Nothing will happen to change the way they feel about one another. No. They will basically be like, fuck you, fuck you. And then somewhere in the middle, they like have a tea party and then they go back to fuck you, maybe? It's unclear. <laughs> yeah. Well, several characters, there are several turns that this movie takes with its various characters where you're like, what? Did something happen off screen, off camera that you didn't? <laughs> Is that going to be filled in in the prequel? So, yeah. So Bill and Gerald head over to the safe room to check it out. I wrote in my notes at this point, Bill is automatically at war with everyone he meets. He's like a house cat. <laughs> <laughs> he really is. Just every, he immediately begins to criticize the safe. Yeah. Yeah. Right. He walks in the safe. He's like, oh, this is fucking stupid. <laughs> <laughs> then he takes a photo of the empty safe with the world's smallest camera because he's a private detective. So he's clearly got like that James Bond spy equipment. Yeah. Right. right. What does he hope to learn from taking a photo of the empty safe? Like here's, <laughs> here's where the money should have been. Okay, that's that's a lot of a lot of information. Be very there. important later. He asks how the money is kept in the safe. She's like in envelopes. He's like, I see, I see. <laughs> Gra- I was thinking gravity. Okay. Also, he asked, "Have you got a key to this safe?" It is very clearly a combination lock safe. Very, very, <laughs> very clearly. A combination clearly. Lock safe. <laughs> I was really hoping we would get some bad pantomime where she was like, "Yes." Yeah, right, right. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But yeah, so Bill doesn't trust anybody. He's got a picture of the safe now, so everything is pretty much under control. (laughs) So now Lorenzo Lamas is showing Bill around the the church, and he comes across the locked door. This is the door to the music room, and he's not allowed to go into the music room. It's private. What? What I liked about this was he says, you know, what's in here? He said, oh, you know, a small music group rents it and they practice in there. And I really, really hoped at that point he opened the door and it was just a broom closet. So, yeah, like I said, they were really small. Very music small. Group. They're all the borrowers. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> now, we should point out because they make a whole big deal of like somebody has to go get a key and they have to get permission. And this is there will never be any payoff to this whatsoever. He doesn't find anything in the music room. There's no reason for this Mm. i can only imagine that some like someone who made this movie is part of a music group and someone used their room without permission they were like put that in the movie put what a violation (laughs) that not even a private investigator would go (laughs) into your music room and i was still watching this film for clues as to where the money went and i thought that's an awfully big flat screen tv on the wall of that church for 2014 that's like a 60 inch or something oh wow the, you've spent some money on that one <laughs> yeah there you go well yeah and, and again the only reason because there's nothing about this music room that is relevant the only thing i can imagine that this scene is doing is you know telling people you know telling churches specifically whose money comes up missing well even if you just hire a private eye they're going to want to go in your music room and get their grubby little hands all over your your sheet music probably Again, if this church is filled with evidence of the murders, this scene makes sense. Right. Yes, absolutely. Maybe they weren't sure whether they were making this one about thou shall not steal or thou shall not kill. So they thought they could do some crossover. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Maybe they were like setting up for the thou shalt not kill movie later. Mm hmm. God, I hope they all take place in the same church. Yeah. We just find this, the morals, the morals of this church just like get worse and worse across the series. <laughs> And okay, so then we get him snooping around the Sunday school classroom, and Constance is like, she comes up by and she's like, "Really? Are you, you're you're seriously looking in the Sunday school classroom for fucking clues? Clues? Is that what you're looking for?" And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm looking in all the rooms of the building that was robbed." <laughs> yeah, and again, the movie seems to think that we'll all agree that that is very obviously a violation of some yeah. Sort. The, Come I, on, uh, Sunday school. Uh, they called you to find the money, not find the criminal. 
<laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and and of course, Bill's answer has to be insane because this is written by an insane person. So she's like, "You realize this is a Sunday school class, right?" And you're like, "You would be surprised the fucked up shit that I have caught toddlers doing." <laughs> yeah, he says something about laying charges, like like he's laid charges against six year olds. It's right. such a weird line. Yes. <laughs> Also, she says about how, you know, well, you know, we, we had to ha have the, the kids learn something called the Ten Commandments. It's like, yeah, but she's only focusing on the not stealing one. There's not a point. It's like, yeah, no, we're constantly telling these six year olds not to make idols of other gods, but this one kid <laughs> will just not quit sculpting tributes to Baphomet. Honestly, a number of times we have to stop really, it. Really? Every time we turn around, we're like, Tyler, is that another golden calf? Are you making <laughs> high places? God damn it. <laughs> Gonna get a disease in your feet, Tyler. And I also love, again, because Bill, is, all his lines are insanity. He says, well, you know, in my experience, the only difference between a Christian thief and an atheist thief is that only one of them is a hypocrite. And I'm like, but like atheists also say you shouldn't steal shit. Do you guys think that we're OK with theft? Yeah. <laughs> well, I just wrote, in fairness, there is nothing about atheism that stops any of us being a hypocrite. We're, there's, <laughs> there's lots yeah, of it right. Yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> trust me, atheist thieves can also be hypocrites. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and now, of course, Pastor Stevens and Bill are going to meet face to face for the first time. How? How is this the first time they're meeting face to face? <laughs> they, he hired him. Yeah. How have they missed each other? He's been in that church all day, as has the pastor. Has it been some sort of like French farce where like one walk into the room and the other will walk out? I know they said it's a big building, but how big is this building? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but, and Pastor Stevens is like, hey man, um, all of this asking people questions and pointing out what a bunch of shitty hypocrites Christians are. It's really, it's really bumming everybody out. Can you dial that back a little? He's like, no, I absolutely can't. You guys are a bunch of hypocrite bastards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is there a nicer way for you to solve this thirty thousand dollar theft? Yeah. <laughs> He's like, look, I know it's a criminal investigation. And we're like, do you guys think it's a, this is a criminal investigation? Cause it's, it's not, not a criminal He's just a private detective. You He's just a guy. That's just a person. <laughs> yeah. Also, it has been a terrible investigation so far. Cause he, so far he's talked to three people, one of whom he asked no questions of. Cause he doesn't ask any questions of the pastor here. And then he's walked around a bit inside a church. And I thought, I bet he's on a day rate. I bet he's charging them a day rate. Yeah. He's just slow walking this thing. <laughs> yeah. Literally slow walking as well. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he's like, you know, look, look, I'd love to, to help you out. But a big part of my method is constantly telling your secretary what a fucking hypocrite she is. And he's like, oh, well, you know, if that's part of your method, I guess. OK, then. Yeah. I mean, I guess as long as she's not the one who stole the money, that's ridiculous. But if she is, that'll really pay off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> So, and after that, after those three conversations and the snooping, we go back to Constance's office. He's there with her and Pastor Stevens. He's like, I've concluded my initial investigation. What? How? <laughs> How has he done that? How has he concluded any part of his investigation at all? He's learned nothing. Right. He's like, I figured out where your coffee is. So that's the, <laughs> that's the initial portion. An investigation has three parts. One, perimeter. <laughs> Two, Yell at everyone in the building. Three, look at some of the rooms, not all of them. <laughs> so, yeah, so we're making progress. Yeah, he's, we're, so he's like, I, I've got this list, though. These are the people that I need to interview as part of my investigation. Apparently he brought a printer with him. Yep. This is a printed fucking list. <laughs> but the pastor looks at the list and he's like, oh, I don't know, man. You shouldn't talk to this many people. Why should he not talk to that many people? Yeah. Interview all the suspects. If you don't care about your money, just tell him to <laughs> stop looking. Right. So, okay. For the rest of this movie, they will act like the only way that one could potentially interview a suspect or a person who might have information about your investigation is to attach electrodes to their genitals. <laughs> yeah. Right. To be fair. They are right because of Detective Bill Broadley, but there's no reason <laughs> to believe that. Well, right. Yeah. Yeah, they shouldn't know that yet. Yeah. They literally make the argument that there's no reason for him to talk to the troubled teens. Yeah. Well, right. And, and not only is there no reason for him to talk to him, but he absolutely can't because if he talks to him, then their trust in the church will be broken. Why? Is that 
their assumption that the church will have a no questions asked policy to rule breaking and uh, and law breaking because that ha- that that would be fair at that point. Yeah, we know the church is very keen to cover things up. I could imagine mm-hmm. if you expected the church has covered stuff up and suddenly you're being asked questions, you'd be like, "Well, hang on, I'm, that's not what I'm here for." <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But he's like, he's going through the groups, the pastor's going through the groups of like, who you're not allowed to talk, don't talk to convicted criminals, don't talk to the troubled teens. What about the how to break into safe groups? Surely they're beyond sus- suspicion. Surely <laughs> we, we couldn't possibly think it was them. I also love at one point, Bill Broadley's trying to say, he's saying like, look, I have to interview all of these people. You lost $30,000 of other people's money. You have a fiduciary duty to get it back. And I'm like, that's not what inconceivable means at all. Yeah, that's- <laughs> Uh, yeah, he, he's really putting the douche into fiduciary duty. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, by the way, outside we have to. So it's so painfully obvious that she's the one who done it. They have to desperately throw a red herring out here. So we get Pastor Stevens walking outside, and Sweaty Stan, the accountant, says, "Oh, uh, hey, I just, uh, Pastor Stevens, I wanted to explain my motive." For stealing 30000 if it turns out that it was me, I want to explain that I have a motive, too. I have some trouble at work about an audit. It's very vague. It's very vague trouble. So then we get Constance arriving home, pulling into our parking lot for the second time in the movie. <laughs> Bitchy exercise daughter comes out to be angry that the car wasn't there for her to go exercise sooner. What is this simultaneous arrival slash departure schedule that they have? I, the only way that this works is if Brenda waits by the door, sees her mom start to pull it, and then just like grabs her yoga mat and starts hustling. Oh, hey, I was just headed to the gym. Can't talk. <laughs> Right, but she's all pissed off because she's like, I wanted to take your car to go to the gym, but damn it, now abused daughter wants you to pick her up from work. Yeah, I guess you've got to pick up her and her abused children, and I'll just be late to Pilates like an (laughs) asshole. (laughs) And that's that scene. Yeah, instead Brenda just sort of dramatically flounces off, but it's very difficult to dramatically flounce off with a rolled up yoga mat tucked under your arm. (laughs) Yeah, it really punches the effect. Loses a lot of the power. Yeah. All right, well, I'll tell you what, since nothing ever rises above boring ass family drama that you kind of wish that your coworkers would stop talking about in this movie, we're going to call that the end of act two and take ourselves a break. But don't worry, we'll be back afterwards, though I can see why you were worried. It's pretty awful. Look, I'm telling you, it's real. Seriously, dude, if you don't want to tell me, you don't have to tell me. It's fine. Hey, guys, uh, what's with the yelling? I, I was asking Marsh what cell phone carrier he recommends next time we're in the UK, and all he'll do is make up silly fake ones. No, that's not very nice, Marsh. I'm, I'm not making them up. We just have different carriers here. Oh, oh, really, Marsh? There's a cell phone company called Sky. Yes. Seriously? Yes. <laughs> okay, that's obviously fake. But if you're looking for the best deal in wireless, why not just try Mint Mobile? What's... Mint Mobile. They're the first company to sell premium wireless service online only. Mint Mobile lets you maximize your savings with plans starting at just $15 a month. So you don't have to listen to fake cell phone companies like O2? I'm telling you, it's real, Noah. Yeah, and so is Asda. Right, sure, whatever. Come on, Marsh. Really? Everyone knows that's a grocery store. Lazy. With Mint Mobile, all plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. Wow, that's great. Where do I sign up? To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash gam. That's mintmobile.com slash gam. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash gam. All right, Eli, I'm in. So there you go, Marsh. You can stop pretending there's a cell phone company called The Number Three. Right, you know what? That's it. I'm done. If you want to talk to me anymore, you can give me a ring through GifGaf. I don't know who he thinks he's fooling. GifGaf? Seriously? (laughs) Bill, thank you so much for trying to help us recover the money. No problem. Here's the list of people I'd like to interview. Oh, interview? Come on, I, I don't know about that. Yeah, is there maybe some way that we could do this a bit more discreetly? Sorry, you'd like me to find out who stole your money without asking anyone any questions? Y- yeah, yes, please. Yeah, that would be great. Um. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, why don't we start by you letting me check out the church for clues. I'll look around the building. Ooh, some of those rooms are private. So, you know, we would have to ask. 
sorry, the rooms in your church are private. Yes. So the, the music club keeps the music in there. Yeah, that's that's not private. That's just where someone keeps a I thing. I, I want to look in I'm those not, places. You know what? I'm I'm not comfortable letting you in there without asking them. Mm, 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 me neither. Me neither. Okay. So just to be clear, you'd like me to find the money without talking to anybody or looking in any of the places. Yes. I mean, that's it. Exactly. I. What am I supposed to do? Just like, hey, anybody steal the money? Pretty please with sugar on top? Yeah, I did. I did it. Okay, that worked. Um, Amazing. Great detective work, sir. Nope, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back for more of this shit. We're going to reopen with Constance and Brenda talking to Julie about her abusive husband. This is where we have to see like the sister conflict. Yeah, and again, this will never pay off nope. or make any sense. Brenda's just like, stupid, getting abused by your husband, idiot. <laughs> she totally does. <laughs> and in fairness, she's saying, oh, you know, it's stupid that you've just got one joint account between you. And you know what? I'm, I'm there for that, absolutely. Having a single shared account between the two of you, not a great... Have a shared account that you both kick into for bills, absolutely fine, even if it's an uneven split, but one account for the two of you to put all your money in. Bad idea to me. That's, Financial independence. Yeah, this is not, that's not a necessary thing, right? This, no. That and like taking off your wife's garter at the wedding ceremony <laughs> are things we could just leave behind, my friend. Don't need that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so it, my, my wife and I've had joint account for like 25 years, but you know, like it's not for everybody, sure. Yeah. I mean, you were children <laughs> when you got together. We, we still kind of were. Yeah. To be fair, Lucinda wasn't able to open a bank account. She was only <laughs> so, 13 years old, right? She'd have to get the, did they no, give her so, little this, pilot's wings I don't at the think wedding? This is very funny the way that you're, to judge you, you're taking it. <laughs> so, okay. So, and, and of course, this is another instance where like, the music kicks in halfway through the scene and it's like it's trying to compensate for missing the first half by being overly dramatic for the second <laughs> half. It, it definitely does. It's so sudden and unexpected that I, I spat my tea out pretty much. <laughs> yeah. It's like, this is the first time that I'd written. It's like the music director turned up late to the edit and then felt too guilty to ask them to go back right. so he could put the music in at that point. Exactly. I'll, I'll just pick up from here, guys. It's fine. It's fine. It's my fault. <laughs> Dave, was that a choice to not have any music in the front of the scene? Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Traffic on I-95 was hell that day. <laughs> so, yeah, but while they're having this conversation, this sister fight, abusive husband calls. Now, Julie doesn't want to talk to him, so we have to watch Constance do this incredibly awful job of doing a one-sided conversation. <laughs> oh, mwah. you know what? Look, these are always bad in TV and movies, but you never appreciate how much worse they could be <laughs> until you watch a Christian movie actor be like, you're going to do what? Well, I don't think you should. Well, now it's my turn to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's amazing. You can't help but do better. You're leaving pauses where the other person would talk. She didn't do any of that shit. No. But once again, following the theme of this movie, they decide not to call the cops, but to call the private investigator again. Yeah. Yes. Like the little sister's like, let's call the cops. And the mom's like, oh, I could call Bill. Or call the fucking cops. Call the fucking cops. Why would you call Bill? That makes no sense. He's not even the love interest yet. But yeah. Unless he is on a day rate. And she's like, I could call Bill because we've already got him for the rest of 20 to 24 <laughs> hours. So it's basically value for money at this point. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So she calls Bill and she's like, hey, you know, my daughter's abusive husband is coming over, possibly armed, possibly wanting to kill her. Do you mind like standing between him and her? And he's like, oh, yeah, no, I, I would stand between him and her for sure. All in a day's work for a private investigator who's been pulled into investigate a robbery in a church you work at. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to picture doing this with anything else. Like, hey, uh, Tony, Heath can't actually make it to the record this week. Do you mind stepping into GAM, Tony, our accountant? Would you just uh, <laughs> hop in? If not, we can ask Julie, the bookkeeper. I mean, we, we can ask Julie. <laughs> so, yeah, but Bill is like, oh, yeah, sure. So he pulls up over to the place. And I love that she's like, sorry for calling you over here. I would have called the cops, but I didn't want to waste their time. It's actually, it's worse than that. It is. I didn't want to be the, the little boy who cried wolf. Yeah. 
Right, but the point is, is like you still are just to a different person now. <laughs> Instead of someone, in fact, who is paid by your taxes to do this kind of shit, you just call some random schmo. <laughs> this also implies that in the universe of this movie, like the police stand there for ten minutes and they're like, you, "They said you said a guy was coming over here to abuse your daughter. <laughs> you have another twenty minutes, and then you don't get to call the police for a month. <laughs> All right, no matter how much you get." murdered we are not coming back here <laughs> well and bill is so bad at this you know she's like it's probably nothing he's probably just blowing off steam and he's like i don't know you know i've seen a lot of daughters beaten to death by abusive husbands i mean a lot i have pictures on my phone actually if you want to look at some <laughs> of them well he's the one who said that the husband's probably just blowing off steam it's like, yeah, just way to undermine the abuse there. It's like, oh, no, it's fine. He, I, I know you threatened right. to kill your daughter, but it's, it's fine. He was just blowing off steam. It's perfectly acceptable. In uh, Yeah, absolutely fine. The weird angry guy in our writer's room would like me to say that not everyone who calls to yell violent threats at their mother-in-law <laughs> means it. <laughs> How much do you deserve being yelled at over the phone? They don't <laughs> always make good on those threats. Sometimes they're just empty <laughs> threats. You just, you just, sometimes you just threaten. Yeah, and she's like, well, would you like to come in and, you know, where there's light and it's and warmth? And he's like, no, no, I'll hover outside of your house for the next several hours. It's fine. Sorry, I'm, I'm having a really good run on Tetris on my Game Boy Color. So I'm going <laughs> to sit out here. The thing is, he definitely indicates that he does want to come in until her two adult daughters step outside. And he's right. like, oh, in that case, no. No, if, if, you, if your daughter's here, then definitely not. Right. Oh, oh. I thought we were going to fuck. There was clearly, we're not going <laughs> to, wait, are we going to, okay, no, yeah, we're not going to fuck. I'll, I'll hang on outside. <laughs> yeah, outside. Jerk off in my car. <laughs> so, oh, and then we have to cut over to the church so that we can get this movie's worst actor. She's the fucking best. Oh, She's drowning on the English language every time she opens her mouth. She's amazing. This is teen outrage lady that doesn't want her troubled teens investigated in this damn investigation. <laughs> okay, so here's what happened, right? This actress, if because that's not a legally protected term, is <laughs> the most attractive person the people who made this movie know. Yes. They were like, okay, you know, your daughter, Kirley is hot so she's in the movie and they were like clearly you speak english flowingly right and she was like absolutely and they were like even when you've memorized the words beforehand and she was like yeah ass i also have a theory here i think this actress recently got invisalign and hasn't quite fully adjusted to them yet okay yes and i think she paid for them with the money from this her first ever acting job. Uh, yeah, right, right, exactly. I wrote her speeches somehow out of focus. How do you do that? <laughs> Doesn't even make sense. It's like so she constantly seems like she was pretty sure that the sentence ended there, but it actually keeps going on the next page, right? Yeah. She had that kind of delivery. It's got a real, the cue cards are a little too far away vibe. <laughs> <laughs> and I would love to... Meet, meet you later. <laughs> Thought it said melt. I'll melt you later. Crazy. <laughs> so why would I keep all this in yeah. the movie? So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we meet her for a minute, and then it, we head back to Constance's place because apparently, when he said I don't want to go in, what he meant is perhaps you and I could sit outside for the several next several hours together. Yep. Right. He didn't want to intrude by coming inside. He wanted to intrude by her going outside. <laughs> I'm actually a little cold out here. So stay outside with me on the front porch. <laughs> but yeah, but this is where we get his backstory. She's like, so you got a wife or a girlfriend? Or he's like, no, I'm a hard-boiled detective. I'm married to the force. Well, to the, <laughs> not the force, but, you know, the job. That I do. I'm married to my own personal police precinct by myself. <laughs> <laughs> my boss is a real asshole, let me tell you. It makes me turn in my gun and badge. This is basically where he just reads out his whole character summary in one go. Just a, right, just yeah. The, the paragraph that you give to the actor to set the character up. He just reads that out. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, right. I'm married to the force. I had two bad marriages, no kids. I'm too driven for that. It's not that I'm selfish, it's that I'm too driven for kids <laughs> yeah when he said when he said he's too driven i wrote that's right heath it's because you're too driven to have kids that's what it is. <laughs> too driven <laughs> this is also where she reveals her backstory that her husband left her for a girl he met on the internet 
Right. <laughs> right. And and he's like, D- should I uh, go kick his ass? Do you want me to go kick his ass? I'll kick his ass for you. Yeah. His first reaction to bringing up the men in her life is, do you want me to beat him up? Do you want me to beat him up? <laughs> <laughs> really wanted the mailman to come over. Hey, I got a package for you. You want me to kick that guy's ass? No. <laughs> Bill. <laughs> Yeah, and then he we have to eventually turn this conversation to her, you know, having her doubts about God, apparently. <laughs> right, and this conversation had been so boring that her crisis of faith is what perked me back up and got me back in. Right, like, right thank God they told that faith, <laughs> rather than this, like, subpar soap opera dialogue that I've been subjected to. There's also this great moment where she's trying to explain how relevant the Bible is. She's like, well, you know, a lot of people find it a lot of relevant advice in the Bible. And I wrote in my notes, for example, do you have any disloyal slaves you've been wondering how to punish? (laughs) (laughs) And then to wrap this scene up in the weirdest possible way, he leaves for no reason. And then abused daughter comes out and she's like, eh? Uh, is he investigating a dead ass? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And she's so chipper, even though the reason he came over because was because her abusive spouse was threatening to kill her. She's she's so chipper. It's it's like she's totally forgotten. Like the actress has forgotten what she's meant to be doing at this point. Right. I wingman you pretty good there, mom, huh? Yeah. And my husband was gonna kill me. That's yeah, pretty good. She's not even married. She's not even married. She invented the abusive husband just to get fell <laughs> over. Just trying to get mom laid. Nothing gets a man wetter yeah. than the uh, stopping a potential abuser. Am I right? <laughs> so, Am I right? So the next morning, Constance pulls up to work again. This is four. Bill's already there. He's already hard at investigating the perimeter some more. What, what are you looking for? Slash <laughs> footprints. I'm looking for footprints now at this time. Honestly, you know what? They haven't let him talk to anybody or open any doors. I too would just be like, I guess I'll check the bushes for $30,000. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to charge you guys, so I better charge you for something. <laughs> if I have time to lean. Well, <laughs> well, but then he explains that he's not even there for work. He just didn't want her to be alone in a big building. So he showed up to protect her Mm. or because he knew that there was a vulnerable woman in a big building. She has no way of really knowing which that (laughs) is, does she, Bill? (laughs) Fucking idiot. (laughs) But this is the day of the big interviews, right? So he's like, so, hey, you know, all the people I'm going to interview, are any of them particularly, you know, thiefy? Uh, Do you, uh, any advice? Um, Maybe you think that probably did it? Yeah, and she says... Sorry, I can't help you. And I wrote in my notes, why? Why can't you help him? <laughs> I feel like you should. Not even not even can, but should help him. Yeah. We need to rob this movie. We'll literally never get caught. <laughs> <laughs> so then we're going to get the series of interviews, right? So it was starting with Bill interviewing Stan the Sweaty Accountant. Yeah, in front of the big safe that he's moved into the middle of the church now. <laughs> yeah. Those things are really heavy on. Yeah. Like that's... safes are meant to be pretty heavy. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Such a stupid prop. Now, of course, Stan is doing his damnedest to be the guilty looking guy. Right. And, and kudos to this actor. He's pretty awful, but he does pull off guilty pretty well. Oh yeah. He's, he's like mopping the back of his head, like a Simpsons character or something like that. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's solid guilt work. The information that's revealed about Stan in this scene that will never be revisited <laughs> is very troubling because he's like, have you ever lost money before? And Stan's like, oh, yeah, all the time. <laughs> yeah, have you ever exactly. put money of your client's accounts into the wrong account? <laughs> yep. Nope. Done that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Have you ever stolen money? Yes. Yes, I have <laughs> stolen money. Are you a habitual gambler? Sure am. Yeah, yep. Sure that's am. me. All right. Well, you're free to go. Yeah. You will literally never be in this movie again. <laughs> well, but so now, of, of course... He doesn't say you're free to go. He has to do his full blown tell me about the code red moment here, which he does to every single person he interviews. Yeah, it's it, this whole thing is so weird. First of all, the suspicion we're meant to be putting on Stan here is like, oh, because his his firm is being uh, been audited, maybe he stole the money. But if your firm's being audited, isn't stealing money? A bad idea because it'll turn up in the audit that you've got money right, that you can't yeah, account for. <laughs> like, it's a terrible time to steal money. <laughs> and they ask him as well, what were you doing on Sunday? And he's like, I was with my brother Frank and then my wife. But what were you doing? And I really wanted Stan to say, I was having sexual intercourse. And then I saw my wife. <laughs> <laughs> 
And he says, oh, well, you know, if you don't tell me, then I'll have to bring your brother in. It's like, you've got no jurisdiction to bring the brother in. No, you can't bring people in. You can harass him at his job, maybe. <laughs> it doesn't even make fucking sense. Excuse me, sir. I'm a private investigator hired by a separate church. Your brother didn't give me the answers I wanted when I talked to him. Will you come with me? Oh, you left. Okay. 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 Well, it's gone. That's how it goes sometimes. So, okay. So we get done with the stand interview. Now it's time to interview Lorenzo Lamas, right? <laughs> and I love it. Lorenzo Lamas' character, Gerald, is trying to alpha male him the whole fucking time. And I think that's because that's just what Lorenzo Lamas does whenever he interacts with another man. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. I have to point out something that is so spiritually and sexually important to me. When he opens up Lorenzo Lamas's file, mm. we get a flash of Lorenzo Lamas's headshot at the very top <laughs> of the file. And it is wonderful. Well, the, the whole file is wonderful if you pause it, because we've got the notes that Bill has taken to help him in this investigation. And so I pause those. So one of his notes on Gerald, the caretaker here, is enthusiastic about working at the church. Not sure that's a note about the investigation no, or helpful anyway. Really. <laughs> Nor is the note, parents both died in his early childhood. I don't think that's pertinent to this investigation, unless you think Gerald is actually the artful dodger in disguise. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, but we, he talks about his criminal history. He was on probation, but then he found Jesus, so now he's good, right? Yeah. Yeah, he says, I've got a purpose. And at that point, the music uh, director slams the nearest piano to him, <laughs> just whatever keys he's got <laughs> at a random point. <laughs> is your purpose a pop scare, by the way? Is it a, is it by any chance? <laughs> My notes here were, oh, Lorenzo Lamas, you woke up the music. <laughs> <laughs> Also, I'm not only sure that Lorenzo Lamas dyes his hair, I'm convinced he's in the middle of dyeing his hair in this interview. Oh, yes. this is a man who dyes his body hair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is a man who hovered underneath what ran down Giuliani's head during that <laughs> press conference. There's a lovely line that he says to Bill as well, when he says, you know, about why you always talk about the Bible so much. And he says, if you're the worst criminal in the world, but you had an in with the judge, would you keep it a secret? Yes, Obviously, unless you, you wanted that keep judge a, to be disbarred right? for being terrible at their job. <laughs> you would keep it a secret. Is that how Christians see themselves? As criminals who happen to be able to bend the judge's ear? <laughs> That's not moral. <laughs> yes, though. But yes. yes. Yeah. There was this thing in the United States with this guy named Kyle Rittenhouse. You probably didn't hear about it, Marsh. It was... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So yeah, so so he Bible quotes at him a little bit. Again, it's completely fucking irrelevant because it's the Bible and it's never relevant to anything. And Bill says, as he gets done with his little Bible quote, he's like, and you wonder what I have against Christians. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I, you're right, Bill, but shut up, man. I do get it because I also hate that book, but you got to <laughs> find your moments. But... <laughs> <laughs> And but finally, Lorenzo Lamas is like, hey, man, are we done here? Like, obviously, I'm not who done it. You've read the script. You know that. He's like, yeah, I guess <laughs> you done it. But we did clarify that we're both very manly men. Right. Yeah, exactly. We took our shirt off and did a tickle fight. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's time for him to interview Pastor Stevens. And once again, he's got notes. Yep. So his notes on the pastor are raising a teenage daughter in his single modest home, brackets, college question mark. So a bit of a motivation there. Mm -hmm. But then he's got the note, enters the church from the side entrance and eats lunch at the same table each day, which is a really weird detail to include how he gets in. We, we want... Especially because he's only been there one day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how does... He... <laughs> There's also the handwritten note, lighthearted man. Really? Wait, yeah, yeah, that's on it. He's written that in hand, in, in his handwriting. So presumably that's come out of this interview, but nothing about this interview or this character or this pastor at any point says he's a lighthearted man. There's nothing at all about him. I guess he was just struggling with the compliment sandwich at some point. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, because the, the pastor's like, the liar, at one point he says, you know, the liar will burn in a lake of fire and sulfur. Anyway, I'm a very lighthearted man. Lighthearted. You know, we have fun. <laughs> we have fun right here. <laughs> and look, I know we've make fun of actors here on this podcast, but I would just like to say I think it's pretty lazy that this actor 
ran a full marathon before deciding <laughs> to do this thing. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Literally, I've never seen a more breathless performance. Yeah. I mean, it was brave him to, to do this while suffering from COVID because statistically he probably <laughs> is. He's in all sorts of risk factors. <laughs> yeah. But, but so Bill breaks it down. He's like, hmm, so your wife died and you've got a young daughter that you're trying to raise on your own and college is coming up. How are you going to pay for it? And he's like, <laughs> Are you suggesting he's like these? Only do who ordered the code red? He's like, don't do this again. We just sat through this twice, man. <laughs> just do this with two other characters. You have no other approaches. I'll electrocute your nipples. Okay, fine, <laughs> <laughs> and not in a good way. But yeah, he's like he has to give the whole you know I'm not perfect, but I'm forgiven speech. Yeah, which again, it, like but fucking poor Bill is heard three times from different characters at this point. And to be clear. In any other scenario except a Christian movie, if someone starts screaming at you about how they're not perfect, but they're forgiven by a 2000 year old Bronze Age morality book, they did it. Yes, they did the thing that you're talking about. 100 percent. Yes, absolutely. And of course, Bill has to point out how silly his religion is. But a little more cleverly than the movie usually allows him to. He's like, yeah, but I mean, if you took the money, you would just ask for forgiveness and then Jesus would have to forgive you. Right. And he's like, yes, but, but then I would have to lie to you about it now. And that's against the commandments. He's like, yeah, but you could ask for forgiveness for that too, right? He goes, <laughs> uh, us. I will have you know there are several, several sentences in the Bible that condemn stealing. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly me, six. <laughs> let me list them in their entirety. Yeah, exactly. Allow me to shout them at you. <laughs> Like a teenage daughter through a closed bedroom door. <laughs> An asthmatic teenage daughter. I was like, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, okay. So then apparently he needs a minute to catch his breath. There's just one line that the pastor says that really threw me. His, his staccato Shatner-esque delivery itself was kind of off-putting <laughs> yes. all the way through. But there's one line that really threw me because he said, and you know, it carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. I was like, hang on. No, you mean wrongdoer, all one word, but the, the way you intoned that made it sound like a case of mistaken identity. Yeah. Like, oh, yes. we were going for this doer, but we carried it out on the wrongdoer. <laughs> the dowager countess. So, all right. And then, but then we get the rest of the interviews in like a little montage. Yes. And it's all characters we haven't met. Yeah. Mm. Right. So he interviews old lady we haven't met, young lady we haven't met, middle-aged lady we haven't met. Yeah, he interviews the lady from The Ring at one point. Oh, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. And this montage, to make it even more insane, is set to Spanish guitar lovemaking music. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Well, so this is, the, this is where I first realized that the music, that the soundtrack was sarcastic. <laughs> and once you realize that every decision makes perfect fucking sense, it's like, oh, are we going to just show, well, some fucking flamenco then for you? God damn it. <laughs> but OK, but finally, the the montage ends and it's time for him to do his final interview of the day. Constance. And it, I want to be clear that the plot of this movie appears to be that he is physically incapable of doing bad cop because he's like, ah, oh, yeah, obviously I, I knew I would have to interview you. So just the standard Fuck you! Are you a thief, you saggy old whore? Your husband <laughs> he left <definitely> you. Does. <laughs> and he goes, Well, so have you ever stolen from the church? And she's like, Well, stationary. I mean, obviously we all steal stationary. That's the sort of the plot of the movie, the underpinning <laughs> of the movie. And he's like, So you are a thief? And 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 she's like, Well, I mean, a stationary thief, I don't think it counts. And then he he goes full, tell me about the code red again. <laughs> yeah, and he, he seems like he's riding her way harder than anyone else in this investigation. I thought this is a sex thing for him, isn't it? Like, is is that why his previous two wives left him? Because there's only so many interrogation scenes you can role play before you start to kind of <laughs> lose energy for the for the scene. I get it. Yeah. Once you get to Raging Bull, they they leave. Pretty yeah. quick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then so we get this is so fucking weird. We get Brenda, the bitchy daughter, coming home from a run. She's always exercising, and she's snooping around in her mom's room when she finds this prayer note. And the prayer note is all about, you know, dear God, please help Brenda be a little more helpful around the house and stop being such a bitch all the time. 
Yeah, I will say, though, mom's got nice handwriting. I have described it in my notes as the opposite of Madison Cawthorns. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like maybe mom's just been leaving conspicuous prayer notes around, hoping the daughter would find them eventually. <laughs> oh, I didn't know this was a thing. So I thought, do people actually write their prayers down? Is it like kind of like a letter to Santa? You've got to write it, you've got to put it in the fireplace, <laughs> and then goes up to God. I don't think it's a thing. I, I <laughs> Uh, but yeah, but she finds then it's it, just passive aggressive. Then it's just passive aggressive momming, right? But it's effective passive aggressive momming. From this point on, bitchy daughter will be cured. Yeah, instantly. Yeah, in, in that one moment, done. Completely different personality. Prayer answered. Okay, so now teen outrage lady is back to garble at us a little bit more. She's getting interviewed by Bill. I love the way, and as you described there, you conflated outreach and outrage, which is absolutely perfect for her character. She's <laughs> doing <laughs> outreach. Lady. Yeah, there you go. I did it on purpose. My favorite thing about this scene is at the end, she goes, I have to go. And then doesn't get up to go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and my favorite line here is one of Bill's, right? She says, none of the kids that I am watching to outreach with did it. And he goes, so wait, you're suddenly an expert in criminal mind that's a quote nobody involved with this movie even knew what she would be an expert in <laughs> then that would be relevant <laughs> so you're saying you know csi and svu <laughs> <laughs> bones <laughs> There's a really weird thing at the very end of the scene as well, because we cut for like about a second back to the pouty daughter in the mum's house. And I thought, did did we tape over the, did the last scene tape over this one? <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> We're just going back to where we were. <laughs> so, okay. So now Bill comes storming into Pastor Stephen's office to like tell him, hey man, I can't do this job if you keep not letting me interview people. <laughs> right? And they all seem to think that Bill is the bad guy they hired him to get the money that's been stolen. And now suddenly he's the villain of the piece. Yeah. yeah. And instead of the pastor defending their decisions or their actions, pastor's going to go on a rant about how awesome God is. Like someone's defending their shitty troubled teen. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like they've been in the backyard, like trying to attack an owl in a tree with a stick for the last half hour. <laughs> and the mom turns around. I'll have you know, he's very interested in cars. And it's like, he's 25 years old. Come on. <laughs> yeah. And the pastor says, you know, defend, because Bill said, well, how can you always like defending God and things like that? If God's so great, why are you defending him? And the pastor says, well, defending God and seeing how great he is are two different things. It's like, yes, that's true in that the latter is just your opinion, whereas the former is you trying to justify your opinion and get me to share it. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. He's like, I'm not defending God. I'm just constantly talking about how awesome he is in the face of obvious challenges to that fact. It's totally different. <laughs> I don't know why you would conflate those two things. Meanwhile, so we, we head back home to Brenda and now she's doing chores. So the chores montage, I figured this out. This is the director making this poor girl clean his fucking house. Yep. <laughs> right. He's like, oh, um, you would probably also clean out from under the stove, too. Right. We should probably get a shot of that. <laughs> OK. Now, look, there are not many times that I get to rub how bad American cuisine is in Marsh's face. But Marsh, <laughs> if you were to guess what the fuck is happening when she pours the can of cum into a dish <laughs> and then puts that into, a, into yeah. an oven. I am baffled by this. She's just making some tasty white gloop that she's cooking <laughs> in a it's big pan like, thing. Like an off-white slop like you would so it's pretty much what i would imagine pigs get yeah <laughs> right yeah also i've got to say the music over this whole cleaning montage is very for just five dollars a month you can give brenda a better life <laughs> yeah for real <laughs> you can sponsor a ginger of your very own so. <laughs> so yeah so then we cut back to the church constance is bringing bill a all right that interrogation was a little much but i'd still fuck you muffin Yep. Right. There's a muffin for every occasion. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and this is where the movie thinks it's going to drop its first hint. Now, I'm going to help you, podcast listener, because this makes no fucking sense. He's just like, hey, is that your tote bag? And she's like, yeah, it's the one I bring all the coffee stuff in. And he's like, nice. Can I have it? And she's like, sure. And we, the movie viewer, who have not read the script, are supposed to be like, 
That's the tote bag she stole the money with. Well, it will eventually be revealed as the big clue, yes. And it's it's not even from her, is it? I thought the grocery bag comes from the janitor. From Lorenzo Lamas, yeah. After. Yeah, that's he's right, like, yes. So Bill asks, have you seen a tote bag around here? And the janitor's like, yeah, yeah, it's in the cupboard here. And he's like, oh, thanks, can I have this? And I thought... Is this just Bill trying to just scrounge whatever free shit he can get? Well, right. He's like, well, apparently they don't care at all about stationery, so I might as yeah, well get a tote bag. Out of the deal. <laughs> oh, God. If the next thing was him walking out of the church with a tote bag stuffed with stationery, <laughs> it would have been incredible. <laughs> well, I wrote, like, because he's he goes, can I keep this? And I wanted Lorenzo Lamas to go, why the fuck would you be able to keep it? No, you can't keep it. <laughs> what yeah. are you talking about? What things in this building can I have? <laughs> <laughs> so the fact that this is the clue makes even less sense because we don't even see her with this bag and nor does he at any point. We never see her with the bag and he doesn't, does he? No. I, I think she has it the first day when they first meet. I, I think. Uh, I, I didn't want to look back and actually watch the fucking thing but yeah i i think <laughs> i get it oh, okay yeah i've been there where we've been watching a christian movie and i'm like oh maybe this is a reference to this and my hand hovers over the mouse for a second and i'm like yeah it's a comedy podcast so, I'll just make some jokes. Really, yeah, yeah. nobody's really trying to pay attention <laughs> to the plot all right well as i'm sure the listeners may have noticed this movie really doesn't do like things happening and whatnot so we're gonna call that scene the end of act two and earn ourselves a break but first let me get back to the hard sell Will Noah manage to concoct suspenseful sounding questions for the last throw? Can questions really be meaningful when asked by such a zero dimensional film? Haven't I already used this cop out meta angle a couple of times before? Find out the answers to something potentially when we return for the lethargic conclusion of Grace of God. Hi, I have no illusions. You know, with Skeptic of the Year Michael Marshall on the podcast today, there's never been a better time for the shake test. Is this about Eli's baby again? Because I'm pretty sure I was really clear with him the first no, time. No, 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 Marsh, not that shake test. The shake test for Raycon wireless earbuds. Oh, what are Raycon wireless earbuds? Raycon wireless earbuds are the best way to bring audio with you because no matter how much you shake things up, literally no matter how much you shake, you know they won't fall out of your ears. Hit it, Eli. Okay. <laughs> That's right. We've attached our very own Eli Bosnick to a paint mixer for the remainder of this ad just to prove that Raycon wireless earbuds stay in no matter what you do with them. Work out, run, or just do errands. And as a skeptic, I can confirm that this is an excellent test of whether Eli will let us tape him to a paint mixer. <laughs> Raycon offers eight hours of playtime and a 32-hour battery life, and they're priced just right. You get top audio quality at half the price of other premium audio brands. It's no wonder Raycon's everyday earbuds have over 48,000 five-star reviews. Headphones are still in. Very dizzy, but the headphones are in. And right now, God of Movies listeners can get 15% off their Raycon order at buyraycon.com slash gam. That's buyraycon.com slash gam to save 15% on Raycons. Buyraycon.com slash gam. Are we done? I feel like we tested it. Oh, no. Scientifically speaking, I think we need at least 10 more minutes. You heard him. Skeptic of the year and all that. No, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mrs. Swanson. Uh, just a quick interview. Nothing too formal. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, I want to see that money return just as much as you do. Of course you do. So first question I've got for you here. You suck. Sorry, what? You suck. You're a smelly poop face. And the thing I know about smelly poop faces is that they love to steal money. Did you steal the money? No. Fat. You're also fat. Still no. Like, sorry, you know that insulting people isn't, like, police work, right? Like, there's other ways of finding out information. Mm, that sounds like something a fat, smelly poop face would say to me. Uh, excuse me, Bill, I'm sorry to interrupt, but little Jimmy's cat got stuck in a tree outside and... Well, you're a tall enough fella. You mind climbing on a ladder and getting it down? Oh, no problem. I'll, I'll tell that cat he's a fucking bitch-ass fuckface stat. Well, no, I don't need you. And he's gone. I think maybe we should have called the police. Yeah, probably. Fuck you, cat. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> And we're back for still more of this shit. We're going to rejoin the action watching Constance pull up in her driveway for a third time. This is the <laughs> fifth pull up all together now. If you told me this movie at this point was sponsored by 
like a break service in Constance's hometown. <laughs> if it hadn't been for her missing the parking brake in the first one, yeah, exactly. Maybe it's just tires <laughs> that sponsor it. Yeah. But this time, though, when bitchy exercise daughter meets her on her way into the door, she says, instead of, I'm mad at you and I'm going to go exercise, she says, hey, why don't I go pick up my sister and her kids for you? There's a nice hot soup pot of gloop waiting for you inside. <laughs> There's a nice hot pot of cream of gloop casserole. <laughs> and she's laid the table for what is clearly a romantic dinner for four because it's all candles and the yep. best crockery and things. Yeah. Yep. Well, yeah, and it's amazing too because we're going to see this dinner. The kids aren't there. No. I don't know. <laughs> the, 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 there are two children in this house that are only ever present if they're asleep. Yeah, we've only seen those kids unconscious, which in retrospect yeah. is really worrying. <laughs> right, yeah, no, if this is two dead kids that live at the house and maybe that's what they're trying to avoid Bill fighting oh, out about. God. Nicole Kidman walks through in a wedding dress. Okay, I get it. It's all coming again. All right, you know what? I didn't see that coming. But she, yeah, she goes inside and the house is all cleaned up now and there's a hot pot of gloop already there for her. And then... And then Bill shows up for no discernible reason within the universe of this film. He might as well show up and say, yeah, I, I noticed that your daughter set four places, but there's only three of y'all. Uh, so I, am I am I in this scene? Yeah, he's got like a fucking sixth sense for available food. It's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he shows up and he's like, hey, I, I brought you some things in your church tote bag. Huh? tote bag brought it back uh -huh. all makes sense now it's gonna make a lot of sense to which the, the constant replies are you here to protect me from my abusive husband or are you here for some pussy am i right <laughs> <laughs> there's an awful lot of that yeah he's like do you want me to sit out in your driveway and master i mean sit out in your driveway again tonight <laughs> And she's like, no, why don't you come in and eat dinner? We're having gloop. And he's like, I love gloop. <laughs> I love gloop. And this is where he says genuinely the most tragic line of the movie. And they don't <laughs> yes. know. It. I can't remember the last time I had a nice night. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's so sad. <laughs> Oh, sure. I probably if I'm lucky, I won't hit my dick on anything tonight. That'll be great. So. <laughs> and this is where they come to like you see them starting to share the amazing meal that Brenda has cooked. But they started off by being in the kitchen, and she talk, Constance talked Bill through sautéing some potatoes, which means that Brenda's weird white gloop <laughs> has just gone straight in the bin. And it's like <laughs> it's like when you're baking like apple pie or something, and you've got some children there, and you give them a little bit of runoff pastry to play with. But you're helping. Yours is definitely got. Right, you're definitely yeah. contributing to this whole situation. <laughs> if you stay there, and we'll just put whatever you do in the bin when you're not looking. Oh yeah, you're, that you're, makes no sense because Eli's special pie is the best part of the meal. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the hardest part of making it is sprinkling the icing sugar on top. That's the hardest part. You're absolutely no, right. No, you're right. Andy told me. Why would Andy lie to me? <laughs> and also, so okay, so we get through the gloop, right? So and we skip through it all together, right? They're like, let's sit down and have some gloop, and then we cut immediately to dinner being over. Bill helping with the dishes. Yeah, while the music director's like. Fuck, man, I don't know. Stick something from Pride and Prejudice under it. Who cares? Just, just get over <laughs> it. So he leaves after dinner. It's a very nice dinner. He keeps the fucking tote bag. He's stolen her bag. Yes. Which makes him a thief as well. So maybe he took the money. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, okay. So mom comes in after dinner to thank Brenda for not sucking for a change. And she's like, so did you have like a... I got epiphany off screen or something. Is your character arc done now? And she's like, yeah, believe it or not. I mean, I'm pretty much, pretty much done. That is the extent of me being in the movie. <laughs> it really is just me being slightly bitchy and then making you dinner once. And that's, uh, that gets us to that sweet, sweet 60 minutes. So yeah. <laughs> Did she go silent for you mid sentence? Oh, in mine, the audio dipped out in the middle of a yeah. sentence. She was saying, I just realized that I've, been blaming everyone else. So what did you say in the middle? What did you say there? What happened? <laughs> did you swear? Have you been redacted? What happened to you? I, I again, I think it's her forgetting the line midway through and them going like, ah, fuck it, doing another take would be a whole thing. <laughs> I mean, we only have so many donuts. I ain't pressing this power button on this camera 
more than twice a day. I told you. <laughs> I, I honestly think this is this is Kate Margaret. I think she said the N word. I think she, okay. she <laughs> had a moment where she forgot her lines and her default is just straight to the N word. Yeah, she was like <laughs> fucking octoroons and they were like, it's okay, we'll cut it in post. <laughs> well, okay, and then mom just kind of casually says, oh, by the way, I'm the one that uh, stole the money. Yeah, and the thing about this is when she said she stole the money, I actually had thought earlier, oh, I think the, the mom stole the money. But then the movie was so boring, I genuinely forgot that I'd thought that. And then this line landed as a twist for me. It genuinely landed as a twist. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought, maybe other movies should try that. You know, bore people so that really obvious reveals feel like a massive twist. Oh, and there thought, you go. Yeah. I yeah. <laughs> no, wait. M-, M. Night Shyamalan did that in The Village. He already tried that. That's been done. Oh, yeah. No, you're right. Oh. He's been doing that for about 20 years now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, but here's the thing, though, is that it is a twist. It did. It was unexpected because it's the most obvious thing. And that's mm. never the right. It, like, that's the first rule of making a whodunit is it. It can't be the person it obviously was, but they didn't get that far. It's also stupid. Well, that too. Yes. <laughs> right. It's, you can't make a whodunit where the answer is, well, that's dumb. Yeah. What am I supposed to be rooting for or against now? <laughs> what is this movie about at this point? <laughs> also, from here on in, I just wanted the rest of this film to be her going on the run and then Bill having hunted down like in No Country for Old Men. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Only if she takes the haircut, though. <laughs> so, yeah, so she's like, yeah, no, I, I to- stole the money to help Julie with the thing that I didn't know about until... After the money went missing, it's a whole thing. It's a call forward. I don't, I don't even understand the terminology. I'll also say that Brenda is incredibly chill. She's like, oh, I stole that money. And Brenda's like, nice. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> you know, if you actually like take into account the amount of taxes that churches don't pay, let alone just like the damage that they've done to social structure, they all owe us more than $30,000. So good for you, mom. Get yours. Yeah. Good for you. I mean, I mean come on. If you, if you hadn't taken it, it probably would have paid to keep rapists out of jail. So it's probably a good. <laughs> oh, no. Our cemetery fund. Am I right, mom? Come on. <laughs> You're the bookkeeper. You know. And then, okay. I love this scene so much. This poor actor. We get Bill melodramatically monologuing to himself about how he feels because he's figured out now that Constance is the thief and he doesn't want to turn her in because he loves her, damn it, and she needed the money and she's a good person. But they don't give him a person to say any of that shit to, so he's just screaming it into the sky. (laughs) He is talking to God. I don't know if this is just me. Have you ever talked to someone and you're testing the water to see if they're mad at you? (laughs) That's how he's monologuing to God. Like, oh, why would you do this to me? (laughs) You're busy. You're mad. You're mad. You're busy. And so this is his monologue, or at least he thinks it's a monologue. The music director thinks this is the big musical number because (laughs) as soon as he says a word, it's like a plung. Oh, you're right. And it's like he's about to launch into a song like it's Les Mis or something like that. (laughs) Really wanted Javert to like sidle into frame. Do you need help with this? Because I I actually am a a police officer as well. I do a little... (laughs) Right, but he knows it's her. He doesn't want to turn her in. He doesn't want to destroy his her whole family. So then he he Googles, thou shalt not steal? Mm-hmm. Mm, he Googles, thou yes, shalt right. not steal. Yes, he Googles. Yeah. Of all, of all the things this movie didn't feel entitled to, Google.com was apparently not one of them. Yeah, but then he, he spends some time really puzzling over that commandment. And, and to be fair, thou shalt not steal is quite the thinker. Yeah, no, it is. <laughs> what, what could God have possibly meant by that one? It is. You really got to dive into that one. Mysterious deep. ways. <laughs> so, and then, okay, so back home, though, we have Constance. She takes the, this is so fucking stupid. She takes a briefcase down from a top shelf and it's obviously the briefcase full of money, but they didn't have enough money to like, yeah, put like $20 at the top of a few bundles. <laughs> well, I wrote, mom is taking a discreet box down from the top shelf of her closet. Don't get your hopes up, Eli. <laughs> and my notes were, please be a dildo, please be a dildo. See? In sync, Marsh. In sync. Well, so yeah, she pulls it down, looks at it, goes, hmm, this sure does have the money in it, and then puts it back up. That was it. <laughs> and then she she tries to pray, but she can't really make it happen. It doesn't really, it just doesn't, She, I, I'm 45, I get it. Sometimes it's just not going to happen, but she tries. <laughs> I get it. It's the important thing. 
her and God sitting in bathtubs in a Cialis commercial. <laughs> if you're having problems praying. So, okay, so she does that. Then we get her waking up the next morning, and damn it if she didn't oversleep her alarm. She'll be late. What? What else could this movie put in our path in hopes of reaching 90 minutes at this point? <laughs> she might as well stumble and like do like the ah bit from Family Guy for six minutes <laughs> while eyeing the fucking line at the bottom of my screen on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, but it, it turns out she wakes up late and she's like, oh, I'm going to not be able to get the kids to school in time. But Brenda's already done all of that because she's a good daughter now. Right. And so they sit down and have that conversation. She's like, so again, did you, you just shift personalities midway through act two? Was there some impetus? And she's like, not really. No, a note. Nope. There was a note. Did you have a whole Scrooge deal and it was just off screen in another film? Is that, yeah. is that what's <laughs> happened here? There's going to be a prequel. There'll be a prequel. It'll explain a lot of this. Are you the honor my mother and father film, but like not? We're just going to see the crossover. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it. All of them are happening simultaneously. This is going to be brilliant eventually, guys. Doctor Strange is just sitting there eating a muffin at the cafe at the end of the movie. <laughs> okay. Okay. I still don't care about Doctor Strange, but okay. <laughs> So she's got a job interview now, right? She, she she tells her mom, she's like, I got a job interview. It's as a fitness instructor because I exercise. That's my personality. We saw that earlier. Yeah. A fitness instructor at an old age home. Dream job. <laughs> Moving around the dead bodies that still have souls in them. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, you know, I've got this job interview. It's payback for my change. And mom is like, no, it's not. That's stupid. It was an invisible beard guy in the sky taking time to personally circulate your CV around retirement homes. Obviously, honey, that's what happened here. Clearly. You know what? That Brenda's been real good. Let's have her spend the last days of someone's life getting them to do jumping jacks. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then she turns to mom and she's like, and you know, I don't want to say it too loud, but uh, I've been praying a little bit here and there. She says it like she was, you know, she snuck some of mom's Adderall or something. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely got a, have you ever felt not so fresh vibe? <laughs> so, okay. So she gets to work. Gerald greets her out front. This, by the way, yes, we are for the sixth time watching this woman park her goddamn car. <laughs> Did she have her license suspended and this movie was some kind of celebration of its return to her? <laughs> <laughs> or was she always trying to get away and then they coaxed her back in for that next scene or something? Yeah. So, yeah, but we learn here that Gerald is starting to come around to this Bill guy. It turns out he's all right when he's not screaming at you for being a hypocrite. <laughs> so she goes inside. Bill's very excited to see her because he has found evidence of Julie's husband, the abusive husband, stealing the money and being a fraud. Yeah, and this is very clearly one of those bullshit phone calls where, where no one's on the other side. But nobody's fooled by it, apart from the music director, who's utterly convinced and goes with it all the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and if you're wondering yourself, oh, OK, so that part of the plot will wrap up. No, he will present this as an option. It will never be followed through <laughs> on. If I'm not mistaken, and maybe I'm misremembering this, but I believe that the resolution to the entire abusive husband storyline is Julie goes back to him because the kids do need a father. Yeah. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Mm hmm. Ah. Uh... Yeah, okay. But we've got bigger problems because it's made the papers that they got their money stolen. Yes, the front page of the newspaper says church searches for missing funds. Okay, I have to talk about this because this is the best difference between script and prop that's <laughs> happened in any of the movies we've watched. So the script says, here, check it out, page three. But the prop is very clearly that the church has been robbed on the front page. Yep, that's page one. So you see him hand it to the actor <laughs> and say, page three, and you see the actor be like, page three, you say. Looks at the front. <laughs> okay. And, and then turns to page three. He's like, but yes, and I guess I'll see, yeah. um, pretend it's also there. Look, they did it again. They printed the story for a second time. <laughs> oh, this is the English version here. Very convenient that you told me where I'd find that one. And it's, it's a really high quality fake newspaper as well. Cause like, read the story on page three. 
of four because it's a four page <laughs> right, <thing>. yes <laughs> and the headline on page three is just first church which is the name of the church and not a headline it's just the name <laughs> of the church on there yep and of course this is where we get i almost went for my best worst the, the criticism that they've received from famous atheist Richard Deacons. <laughs> Deacons. <laughs> so subtle. Richard Deacons. Deacons. Even the actor pauses when he gets to that part of the news story and looks at the camera like, are you fucking kidding me? Seriously? Okay, Richard Deacon? Deacons. Okay, mm-hmm. whatever. I see. I wrote in my notes, wait, wait, wait. Let's hear it out. How does this Richard Deacons feel about trans people? Because I might be willing to switch. <laughs> 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 Are we allowed to wish wish that Richard Deacons had died a while ago and hadn't disgraced his legacy? Is that legally right, yeah, allowed? Exactly, I think yeah. legally that's allowed. I think, I think we can say that. So, yeah. And then, of course, he throws the newspaper and a gong plays in case you hadn't picked up on the sarcasticness of the soundtrack yet. <laughs> <sighs> so then we have to see how hard it's gotten for them now that this has become public knowledge, right? So we see Constance checking the church's messages and their email inbox, and it's all people very angry about the theft. They... They try to do hate mail, but Christians are 100% of the people who write insane hate mail and leave insane <laughs> voicemails. So it's like, hello, I, not a Christian, am angry. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the emails are fantastic. There's an email from Lauren Mayer who messaged at one minute past 10 a.m. with a subject line, missing funds, question mark. And then emailed again at 10 or 7 with withdrawing support immediately in block capitals. And what did Lauren learn in those six minutes? So <laughs> did she pick up the newspaper, read the headline, send an email, read the story, send her follow up email? Well, so I feel like she read what was on page one and then she got to page three and she's like, oh, holy <laughs> shit. All right. This is serious. This is the this is where the really dark shit starts. This is Richard Deacons was involved in this shit. There's an email from a guy called Hector Nunez, which just says money question mark. Just heard about the money that was stolen. End of email. Okay. Well, <laughs> All right. <laughs> just keep me up to date. Cool. Well, yeah, no, that's, that just seems like downright pleasant. He's trying to start a conversation. <laughs> oh, I get it. Sometimes my mom sends texts as emails. I don't know how she does it, but it happens <laughs> occasionally. I think her and Hector Nunez have the same phone provider. Oh, so yeah, so the, they're, they're, this is getting really hard for them. So they go to see Bill because they think for some reason that Bill the investigator is the one that leaked this to the press. And he has the worst series of potential justifications for he says he didn't do it but then he's like but isn't this good isn't all publicity good publicity uh, the fact that you guys are thieves isn't that good for your public image really because otherwise people wouldn't even know you existed now they know you exist as thieves no <laughs> at one point stan chimes in people who don't even go to this church complained and it's like why would you care about that yeah, exactly it's like we've had <laughs> we've had dozens dozens of complaints including from people who've got nothing to do with us yeah right right it's, it's, it's fine then it'll be fine but they tell him like well you have to understand this has damaged god's reputation christianity itself has been harmed here he's like i don't i don't think that's true <laughs> <laughs> I think Christianity is going to make it through this one, guys. I think you're going to be okay. Yeah. And then, uh, oh, we get the scene where Bill and Constance run into each other out back for lunch. Okay. This scene was boring and I didn't care about it except for one absolutely insane line. I bet I can guess what that line is. <laughs> They're talking and he's like, I've been in solitary confinement with suspects who haven't showered for weeks, but nothing like this. What? So... So first of all, you haven't been in solitary confinement with suspects. I'm sorry, that's not, you can't do that. But also, why? Yeah, why? Why would you be in solitary confinement? Why would suspects be in, I mean, convicted <laughs> suspects? Maybe you used to work for the NYPD. I don't know. I, you know, I've waterboarded some people. While I wasn't feeling very good in my tummy. I don't, it's, it's a really weird fucking line. <laughs> and then of course he's you know of course he's figured out that it's her so he's just hitting around that he's pretty sure he knows who did the thief thing and whatnot and she says oh you found the guilty party and then he goes on this weird monologue where he's like well you know i found a lot of guilty parties including myself turns out i don't follow the ten commandments so i'm just as bad as the person who stole the money yeah he's like i've did some research on the ten commandments like yeah I- i'm sure it took a lot of research to read all ten of those <laughs> i did some research on them and he said and it turns out i'm quite the sinner it's like bill do you want to 
you want to list which ones of those you've broken? Because some of those I don't <laughs> care about, and some of them I definitely care about. <laughs> well, well, yeah. How did, what were you doing in solitary confinement? Is my question. Yeah. <laughs> Flash cut over to Bill's apartment. It's filled with idols of Baphomet. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so then Pastor Stevens goes to see Bill at the end of Bill's day, right? And he's like, how's the investigation going? And Bill's like, man, made for a boring fucking movie. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a moment I have to, we, we can talk about the ADR, which is coming up. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. at the beginning of the scene, we have to talk about the pastor sitting down. The pastor sits down and his chair makes a giant creaking sound and the entire scene grinds to a halt so that the actors yes. can wait for that sound to stop. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing. And then he starts to, he's like, you know, so, hey, you know, Bill, you've done a lot of investigating for us because you're a private investigator. I'm a pastor. Do you need some pasting? <laughs> I could do that for you. And he's like, yeah, you know, I actually, I actually could use some pasting. So he gives the most amazing prompt I've ever heard, right? This is the, the writer obviously had their silly fucking thing that they wanted to say. So the way they get into it is Bill says to the pastor, and I quote, this whole belief thing, I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to whom do you God religion? <laughs> what words would you like to say now? <laughs> would you like to talk for three to five minutes? <laughs> Only if I'm allowed to do the weirdest intonation possible. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Right, yeah, and the pastor gives him this whole long speech about how it's not just about believing that God is great. It's also about believing that you fucking suck. Yeah. Yeah, he says uh, even one sin makes you a sinner. So, you know, in a way, we all stole the $30,000. Will that work? <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the most fucked up thing is that they, they tried so hard to get into this point, and then the point that they came up with was so banal. <laughs> the only reason it's particularly noteworthy is because in the middle of it, we get the weirdest ass ADR in the history of ADR. <laughs> what happened so, there? Why? Okay. He's like, and it's important that people know that God, sir, and then it's a shot of the back of his head and it's, uh, it's like, sent his only son to die for you. <laughs> we might as well have tried to dub in a couple of sentences of Twim with Eli's Lucinda impersonation, right? <laughs> hey, y'all, it's me. It's that <laughs> fucking bad. <laughs> Squinting there. <laughs> and in fairness, the guy who they do get to do the ADR his intonation is perfect. They should have used him for the entire Yeah, that's thing. true. Yeah. <laughs> they should have just dubbed him all the way in Darth Vader style or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but so, and, and, and also, by the way, it's not like the thing that he ends up saying in ADR is approximately the same length as the thing that we're seeing him say, right? <laughs> no. The back of his head just keeps jawing long after it's over. It's like, you can cut whenever. You don't have to show the whole <laughs> back of the head scene, guys. Mm -hmm. But at the end, ultimately, he invites Bill to a sermon, right? He's like, why don't you come to the Sunday sermon? He's like, oh, because you guys suck and you're all hypocrites. He's like, right, but you could say it's for the investigation. He's like, oh, good call. Yeah, maybe I could be Christian after all. Which means it's on the clock. So in fairness to Bill, going there is now work. He can charge for that. Oh, nice. Okay. All right. I love Bill. <laughs> so... And then, okay, so we cut to Constance's place where Julie tells her that she's decided to go back to her abusive husband, right? And mom says, and she says, why would you do that? She's like, well, you know, he stole all my money and, and we'd lose the house. Otherwise, she's like, what if I told you that I just happened to find $30,000 the other day? Yeah, and the daughter's like, mom, that's bullshit and you know it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an absolute puncture. Though. And this is meant to be a really you know, dramatic scene. And midway through the dramatic scene, the music director plays the opening notes of Mission Impossible. I think. It was like they were the two of them were going to have a sword fight just then or something. It was so weird. When she's like, no, I saved up some money. She says, did you save up exactly the amount of money that just went missing from your church, mom? She's like, exactly that much. Isn't that weird? It's so weird that it would be that much. But yeah, Julie is very disappointed in her mom for the theft and she doesn't want her thief money. So then we violently cut outside where abusive husband is pulling up, right? Now, Bill is there for reasons yet unexplained. So he just 
jumps out of his car and says, hey, wait a minute. Are you a man walking into this house? I think I'm supposed to fight you. <laughs> yeah, Bill was just watching their house anyway. Freelance. So how, how long has he been doing Freelance. that? Freelance. So creepy. Yeah. And and of course, he, he stops the dude and he's just like, he's about to be like, hey, you're the abusive husband. I'm going to beat you up. But then he realizes he doesn't know who this person is. He's like, I guess this could just be the DoorDash guy. So he asks, hey, whoa, should you be here? <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 do you, is, is this your house? <laughs> <laughs> you have a minute to talk with, you know what, never mind. So yeah, so David, the abusive husband, quote unquote, swings at him. Oh, it is the least convincing punch I have ever seen committed to film. Yeah, I, I could only tell he was going for punch in retrospect because, you know, like fucking Bill does some risk control bullshit. And I'm like, oh, he must have been trying to punch him is what it was. Yeah, that's like results oriented analysis. It's like, will he end up there? So I guess it was a punch. Yeah, right. He might as well ride at him on a horse with his fist out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so then they come out and they're like, hey, Bill, did you just show up at my house and start beating up the people in my yard? And he's like, uh, well, yeah, I mean, I did ask him if he if he's supposed to be here and he refused to answer the question. Yeah, right. Yeah, so everybody's mad at everybody. Everybody storms off. There, there is one moment where Bill gets the shit punched out of him, which is kind of nice. <laughs> That's very funny. It's very funny because they're like, let him go. And he's like, whatever, I'm a bad, abusive husband. And they're like, right, but we're letting this part of the plot go. And he's like, okay, bye. <laughs> and just like sucker punches Bill and then runs away. <laughs> and then runs out of the movie altogether. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it, Constance is mad at Bill, and Bill is mad at David, and David is mad at Julie, and Julie is mad at everybody, and boy, it sure is getting act three-ish around here. <laughs> oh, we see Constance try to fake cry Ooh. following this scene. Ooh. Oh, it looks like she she manages a giggle hiccup, and then the second time she tries it, it's more of a trying to fart quiet. <laughs> 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 Yeah, so yeah, the, like, and then like late that night, she tries to talk with Julie, but Julie doesn't want to talk to her. So she tries to talk with God. She goes for the cry praying. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's wonderful. We also get Bill dramatically studying the Bible. Oh, of course. Yeah, of course. And, and looking from there to his little picture of Constance's headshot that he had in his file. <laughs> it's so weird that like, cause, like adults don't have yearbook pictures. What would those? Be? I don't have a picture of myself like that. Anyway, <laughs> I don't know where the hell he's even getting these. So, OK, so the next day we've got the sermon, right? This is the big sermon that Pastor Stevens was worried about the other day. This sermon is the best. <laughs> <laughs> OK, can we talk about the fact that he starts this sermon like he's going to offer a choose your own adventure? <laughs> I, I had many choices for what to do a sermon about today. What it, What do you guys think I should do my sermon about? Yeah, all right. About? So cheer, everybody cheer <laughs> for the one that they would like me He's to do. The, if he had done the applause <laughs> meter with his arm, this is my favorite movie. <laughs> oh! <laughs> then... He does the like, I'm Spartacus thing. Yeah. Right? Yes. He's like, I stole a sermon. You all thought I was talking about the money. He waits so goddamn long. He's like, I have to confess to you that I am a thief. And I'm like, yeah, but not of the 30,000. Dude, say not of, are you going to say not of the 30? Like, they're picking up pitchforks by the time he says, but not of that $30,000. I stole a sermon from some other pastor and didn't even tell you guys about it. So I'm confused about all of this, because first of all, aren't sermons largely taken from the Bible anyway? Yeah, I don't. I, well, I guess so there's... He's not really plagiarizing. He's just doing a thing from the same source that they are. I, I think they share sermons, generally speaking, anyway. Right, right. He stole the same idea somebody else stole. Yeah. Yeah. And also, he's confessed that he's a thief, but like, not of the missing money, but... We now know that you're a thief and you've already said that to steal one thing is as bad as stealing everything. Bill's already established if you steal a paperclip, you could have stole the money. So now we know that an admitted thief had full access to the money. Take him away. Clear his clothes, boys. Well, there you go. <laughs> Just have the police come in. There you go. Well, but then, of course, Lorenzo Lamas has to stand up because he also is Spartacus. And he's like, I also am a thief. I have used the church's cleaning supplies in my home. And then 
And then Stan is like, I've used the software. And you're like, oh, they're going to do the Spartacus thing. But that's it. Yeah. The rest of the church is just like, you guys suck. Boo. Well, the, the Cindy. Idiot outreach girl has to stand up and do her oh, thing. Yeah. She has Sorry, to... it's four people, yeah. not three. Her thing's terrible. She said, I'm a thief. I've been rounding my hours up instead of down. It's like, you should not be rounding your hours down. That's giving your employer free time of yours. Right. So that yes. your employer's the thief. Record your hours accurately. Oh, fuck it. Go to the nearest corporate hour. It doesn't matter. Take the fucking money from them. That doesn't make you a thief. Right. Absolutely. And of course, it's just the named characters that we're going to get this from, right? So each of Apart from Constance, I really wanted Constance to be like, I'm a thief. I stole the $30,000 from the church. Oh, shit. Sorry. I got <laughs> taken away from <laughs> Oh, you got me. You guys got oh, me. I it thought isn't we were even, all doing it. It is rabbit season. There's a moment where the pastor as well, the pastor says, only our God is perfect. And I want to like a booming voice in the clouds. I'm a thief. I stole <laughs> many of my myths and legends from existing folklore. And more of my, mor- most of my moral code was already in existence before I was invented. I'm Yahweh and I'm a thief. I wanted one guy to not get what they were doing. He's like, I, I also am a thief. I stole the kidneys of orphans and auctioned them off on the black market. Why are you guys all looking at me like that? Stop it. Oh, uh, Chris, we need to talk to you after church. Okay, <laughs> Can you hang out, man? Don't worry, we won't call the police no matter what. Apparently. No, worries. <laughs> no, but we gotta hire a different PI. <laughs> So, but, but ultimately the conclusion of this stupid ass sermon is that we, really, if you think about it, we should be thanking God that that $30,000 went missing because it all gave us a chance to reflect on how you shouldn't steal. How amazing would it be if just one parishioner had been like, what the fuck are you guys all talking about? <laughs> you lost $30,000 of money we thought was going to charity, and now you're just standing up saying random shit you did? I hate it here. I hate it here. I'm a Muslim. <laughs> so, and then so we cut the sermons over now. Bill is sitting with the pastor, and he's like, yeah, you know, I'm sure sorry that I couldn't find your money. And then Constance comes in with the money. She's going to give it back. <laughs> She's super sorry. Yeah. yeah at, at this point, I really wanted it. When she says, like, I, I took the money, I really wanted them to be like talking to their collars. We got it, boys. Woohoo! And then a team of feds like, bust in from all corners of the room. There's a Christmas tree behind it. It stands up. It was a fed in disguise the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> the Spartacus thing works. Get her. Yes. <laughs> And there's this great moment. This is fuck because Christians are so stupid. They don't know what when he says, well, we won't be pressing charges and you could still work here. And I was like, no, 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 <laughs> the pressing charges thing. But yeah, and you can do this again if you ever feel like it. You're still <laughs> like, just the rest of their work lives. He's like, oh, where's my pen? Costas, did you steal my pen to give to your abused daughter? <laughs> I got a check on, you know, because of the thing. Well, and then she turns to Bill and she's like, but Bill, please don't judge all Christians on the fact that I stole $30,000. And he's like, I'm, I'm just judging you guys on what a bunch of assholes you are. I, it's not like there was a good Christian before you that could offset this. So, but Bill is conflicted, so he wanders off. And then we cut to like sometime later, Constance trying to get a hold of Bill, but having no luck at all. She's very worried about him. She leaves him a message that says, Bill, are you okay? We're worried. I really wanted him to leave a voicemail back. That's just like, yeah, my, my job is over and you turned out to be an asshole and a liar. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> also, like, he, he solved the case. He absolutely yeah. solved the case. Yep, that too. But don't worry, we have to conclude this relationship <laughs> in the craziest and dumbest possible way. I know I've done this before, podcast listener, but go ahead. Take a second and pause the podcast and imagine what the dumbest possible ending for this relationship could be. Because Bill is now going to show up to give her his money Mm -hmm. for her daughter. Yes. Right. He comes. Well, first, he's got to explain what the bag was all about. He's like, I saw you bringing the bag home. So I figured, oh, you probably stole the money in the bag. And she's like, oh, I totally did steal the money in the bag. He's like, yeah, no, I'm a good detective. It's like we nailed it on the whodunit. But it just so happened that I have an emergency account and look how much money it had in it. And we see the amount, right? It's like $32,113.08 or whatever. Yeah. And she goes, my God, that's the same amount that I stole from the church. She's like, right to the penny. And I'm like, why would you never have shown that to us then? Yes. Why would she? Why did she steal 
pennies. <laughs> Why is she take- yeah, right, because it was in cash. Yeah. It's not like she was stealing the checks. You're Which right. Fucking- she, there was 12 cents sitting there later at the end, and she goes like, well, I'm going to take the fucking 12 cents. Well, I'm not going to leave 12 cents. That's <laughs> yeah. just a dick move. But like, it also implies that one of the parishioners donated yes, 12 cents. Right. <laughs> which is very much, I'm putting in just enough to make the plate tinkle, right. but nobody can see how much it is. Yeah. <laughs> That's two nickels and two pennies right there. <laughs> oh my God. I didn't even think about that. That's amazing. But yeah, he had 30 grand in his emergency account. So he's going to give that to the daughter. Right. Because it's exactly the same number. And therefore, you know, somebody just wanted me to give that money away because it's the exact same figure. And it's like, okay, if I guess how much is in your bank account, Noah, can I take that as a sign that I should have all of your money? <laughs> Mars, you should offer to do that with me. Zero is a much easier guess. <laughs> yeah, no, this is with a guy with a baby. It's going to be much easier to figure out. <laughs> but she takes his money. This woman is the world's greatest thief. Yeah. Because she took money from the church, gave it back to the church, and managed to get money out of the private detective she hired to investigate her own theft. And she walks away scot three. Who had already decided not to turn her in when he figured out it was her. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fucking, it's a genius. This movie should be called How to Get Away with Stealing 30 Grand from an (laughs) idiot private detective. (laughs) Like, if at the end we found out everyone involved in the church was involved and it was like, the church just collapsed down like it was, uh, like it was all part of the hustle, like it was the big con kind of thing. And then they all disappeared. That would have been the best way to end it that the church was never there in the first place it was all just part of the con <laughs> that they were pulling on this one private detective they- <laughs> like paul newman and robert redford just like walk in <laughs> from the from the side of the scene. right yeah exactly <laughs> so yeah so but he gives her the money and, and asks if he can sit with her at church because he wants to be a christian now and that's just that that's the end of that. But, of course, we still have the John Ratzenberger parentheses to close. <laughs> right? So we, we cut back to John Ratzenberger. He's like, so anyway, that was the movie um, there. Let me wrap it up. Now, so again, clearly what happened is they'd already filmed this movie. They, and then they made a deal with John Ratzenberger to get him to come in and, and do his bit. But there's nothing for him to do. Mm-mm. Right? The movie has already resolved all the silly ass shit that it needed to resolve. So he goes on this weird rant about how, yeah, stealing is wrong, but also that means that God is down with private property and he isn't some kind of commie. <laughs> it's so weird. First of all, he he starts that rant by opening the Bible. Like, as he's talking, he opens the Bible, he gets the passage that he wants, and he reads, Thou shalt not steal. And then he closed the Bible. And I thought, I'm pretty sure <laughs> <laughs> you didn't need to open the book for that. You could probably probably be fine. And then he starts ad-libbing synonyms for stealing for other things that aren't acceptable, just other other forms of stealing, other words that also mean stealing. Then he gives examples of things that aren't allowed to be stolen. It's just such a weird... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm pretty sure throughout this, he's been stealing a taste from the hip flask that he's keeping in his jacket yeah. pocket. And I yeah. think that explains all of this. He's definitely mm-hmm. trying to make a word count, though. But yeah, and he's <laughs> like, and just so you know, God's not a commie. Anyway, let's close on a prayer. And he can't even get through the prayer. They fade out on him starting a prayer. Yeah. Yeah. Like, if he had remembered that whole prayer, I'm pretty sure we'd have seen the whole thing. (laughs) And we'd fade out after line one. (laughs) Dear God, please let Ted Danson start returning my phone calls again. (laughs) He said he got a new phone when I showed up at his house that last Thanksgiving, but he's never given me the new number. (laughs) So... Yeah. So the closing thought of this movie was God wants you to have shit. And then we fade to credits. So I, help me out here, because I feel like the moral of the story is go ahead and take the money. They won't mind. But I feel like that's also not what they were going for. So any guesses? What What is the moral of this story? The moral of the story is how to steal money from an idiot private investigator. You need to set up this fake church, oh, okay. a fake pastor, <laughs> a fake money, and the whole thing works. All right, it's like a, it's like an orientation film for a new job. I got it. Okay. I was going to go with see Mars should too make me the treasurer for Mercy Side Skeptics. So <laughs> no, see, we've all go. got you know, different takeaways. Turns out nobody minds. And well, that's going to do it for our review of Grace of God. That's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still need to light this fuse once again. So Eli, tell us what's on deck. 
We'll be back in the world of Christian sports with the movie Prayer Never Fails. I feel like it does, but I guess we'll find out next week. So with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 334 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to Marsh and a reminder that you can find his other projects linked on the show notes and perhaps an even huger thanks to all the Patreon owners that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among the ranks, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help us a ton by leaving a five-star review, sharing the show on all your various social media platforms, and telling your friends. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Atheist, Citation Needed, D&D Minus, and The Skeptic Ground, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are brought by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson takes care of our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slot. We have little drafts on Mars. All of the music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Neil Ibosnick, I'm No Illusions. Promise to work harder or another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with a Breakfast Club close. The $30,000 was finally deposited in the church bank account before being immediately transferred to one of the church's many sexual abuse victims. Yep. Yep. The writer went on eventually to realize that he'd never resolved the abusive husband plotline. Police managed to escort John Ratzenberger from the movie set without any major injuries. (laughs) (laughs) No, I do Christian movies. This is clearly a Christian movie. You can't stop me. It's <laughs> property rights. <laughs>Proceeding podcast is a production of Puzzle and Thunderstorm LLC, copyright 2022, all rights reserved. Seven iconic housewives from four different cities. Look at this water. We're going to give them something to talk about. Vacation at Turks and Caicos. It's a party now. The Real Housewives Ultimate Girls Trip. All episodes streaming now, only on Peacock. Progressive Snapshot can save you money based on how you drive and how much you drive. So the safer you drive, the more money you could save. Now, if you didn't hear that because you were looking at your phone while driving, let me say it again. Seriously, put down your phone. That is so unsafe. If you didn't do stuff like use your phone while driving, you could save money with Progressive Snapshot. But saving or not, just put it down. And if you did hear it the first time because you weren't looking at your phone, nice work. You'd love Snapshot from Progressive because it rewards safe drivers. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Snapshot not available in California and North Carolina or from all agents.